Okay, got the red smoke. Sun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Come on with it, man, give it to me, I need it. It's like uh, borrowing the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a funny way to look at it. No, that's what I was thinking on the way up here. It's like, okay, every time you see a Star Wars movie, somebody settles into the Millennium Falcon. They're just like, oh, fuck yeah. But you got to give it back. Yeah. I'm actually, my next move, my goal for 2020 is to uh, build a studio. Where are you going to do it? In Montana? I'm going to do it in Montana. I actually will have uh, probably, I will only release on Mondays. I Like we were talking about before, I'm baffled by your ability to create the volume. Um, so I do Mondays, but about two two out of the four guests per month are willing to come up to Montana. Really? Yeah. It, well, we were texting about this, right? The That's pit, great. It doesn't suck up there. No, it doesn't It's beautiful. Suck. Yeah. So why not come up for a day and visit and go and check you, it? Do you fly them in? I do. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking that too, that if I ever did decide to move to a place like Montana, I wonder how much of my people would be willing to do it. And like, especially if I found a nice hotel and set everything up for them, yeah. car service, flights all taken care of, car service. I could answer know. that for you from a percentage perspective. It's 100% of the people would still. I don't know about a lot of the comics. <laughs> comics wouldn't do it. They're Your too busy. Your platform's massive though. Yeah, but they're busy. They don't have the whole day. See, if they live in L.A., the beautiful thing about oh, it they is can come in they can come and leave their apartment, come here in an hour, we hang out for a few hours. But who knows what the fuck is going to happen once all this shit is over. That's the path. It was when you say living in L.A. So this is my second time back. The first time when I was here, like a month ago, was the day that they uh, announced yeah. to stay in place. And we were like walking on the Santa Monica Beach, as were many people. As was the guy standing in ankle deep surf, trying to control the ocean, doing tai chi. It was amazing, and I'm not sure if he was successful or not, but he was working it for over an hour. <laughs> but I, we drove up to uh, Malibu yesterday, and I was talking with Brian about this yesterday. Two things have kind of struck me since just being back in Cali for 48 hours. One is fences separating people from open space along the beaches. Like, go home. Get out of here. Like, there's this beautiful Southern California beaches and weather, which is probably why most people are here, and you can't go there. So they're restricted from that. And the second one that is- Fences that keep people from the beach? Because those are illegal. There are fences up along sections of the beach with signs that say, this is closed. Oh, because of the pandemic. Because of the pandemic. Okay. It's just okay. so, it was so crazy to see yeah. the beautiful, pristine, completely vacant- Open spaces. That's a big issue right now. I don't know if you're, you're aware of this, but today, this has been the governor came out with a uh, a statewide mandate that all beaches and parks had to be closed, and everyone blew a fucking gasket. San Diego said you can suck my dick. <laughs> Mendoza, um, uh, uh, Humboldt County said you can suck my dick. They said this is unconstitutional, and then the government backed down. So it's interesting. The governor has backed down off of his. Uh, his decision to try to control the entire state and tell them that they can't open their beaches up, which is a good thing because he's he's pushing so hard to keep these fucking businesses closed down for a long point. He he wants it somehow or another to go deep into 2021 before restaurants are fully open and comedy clubs are fully open. And you know, how, can, how can those businesses survive? They're not going to, and he doesn't. His job doesn't depend on them surviving. Oh yeah, they're completely detached. So to him, it's just a decision he's making on paper. Yeah, and if he can make it seem like he saved lives, the problem is, it's not. It's not good. Like this, this fucking disease is not good. But it's not what they thought it was going to be. The numbers of people that have actually died in this state alone, I think they're only at eighteen hundred. I mean, they are destroying the economy. And if they do bring things back up. How many people are going to commit suicide? How many people are going to become drug addicts? How many people's lives have fallen apart and they're going to be severely depressed and it's going to change the course of their life? And who knows what impact, what ripple effect that's going to have on the rest of the economy. All this stuff needs to be taken into consideration. I don't know if it has been, especially when you're looking at a number that's as low as 1,800. Like, I'm not For saying that- For a state that, of millions. Yeah, and I'm not saying that if your parents died or your mother died or your friend died, it's not a tragedy. It is a tragedy. But so is cigarettes, so is heart attacks, so are car accidents. I just think that when you're, when you're looking at an entire gigantic state, 
there has to be a, a rational response to a problem. And I don't know if this is rational. I think this is. I think they should probably start opening things up and and giving people the option whether or not they want to do it. If they need to make a correction in the future, fine. I'm just hoping also that this new drug they found, this antiviral drug, what is it called? Remsviral. I know what you're talking about. I'm not yeah. even going to attempt to say exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> I'm hoping that if that fixes people, like, let's, let's fucking party again. Montana moved to phase one of reopening Good. on Friday of yeah. last week. Nice. So what are they allowing? They're doing retail with social distancing. Restaurants, I believe, with outdoor seating or limited capacity, which that's an interesting uh, conversation too, because like, is it worth it for a business to stay open at a maximum of twenty-five to fifty percent capacity? Right, They're probably still losing money. I yeah. would bet. They're pr- hoping to keep people hanging on until they could fully open again. Right, so it's just a well, it, and that and the bridge gap. You know the the what is it? Pay tech, paycheck protection program in the small business. So I have a LLC, an individual one. And I was like, "Oh shit, I could get some some money because I you know, I spent about a third of my year doing public speaking. Guess how that's gone for the rest of 2020? <laughs> not so good. <laughs> no, and it's not. It's it'll come back, but the companies are like, we can't we can't do it. We physically cannot get together and meet. So I was like, "All right, cool. Small Business Association offers like it's like ten grand. Went on to do the website. It took me like 20 minutes to finish it on the website, which is nothing, and didn't even get a response email. I have. <laughs> I it's just like. You know, I, I'm watching, and I'm so far from being an economic expert or understanding government at a deep level. But you know, you're watching like they're funding these programs, and I can't even get a response email. So you you have to assume that a lot of people are in that same boat, and somebody's holding that money. The time value of that money somewhere is probably doing somebody pretty good. Probably right. <laughs> if there's a bunch of it sitting there collecting interest, the longer they can hold on to it, the more it's valuable. Oh yeah. How, well, how much has been approved? Trillions of dollars, isn't it? Is it? Really? Let's just say it's a couple hundred billion. I think the interest on a couple of hundred billion probably doesn't suck. Oh, that's pretty pricey. Yeah. But yeah. it's frustrating because I know other people who are in the same boat and they are relying on the program to try to claw their way. You know, I see restaurants doing only takeaway. I, I can't even imagine yeah. you know, trying to survive in that. But it's uh have you have your thoughts changed on it at all in the last month since in we what, saw each other? In what way? Well, I remember when uh when we sat down for uh, for your show, you're like, so what do you think? And at that point, I didn't know. And it didn't seem like many people did. Like the models have st- statistically changed quite a bit. Yeah. Like you were talking about the mortality rate. I guess I mean just in general. Are you still – are you going out more? Are I, you – Yeah. Well, I don't because the rules are you're supposed to stay home. So I'm just staying home because it's not that bad. Um, my kids are watching – uh, their computers for school. They they do a thing with a Zoom online. chat yep. online. Um. So we're all home. So it's not terrible. You know, I'm not doing stand up, which kind of sucks, but it's not the worst thing in the world. So, I mean, I just think, look, wait it out. Let's see how it goes. But my my thoughts of whether or not I'm worried about the disease change every two hours. <laughs> one Based hour, on the information you yeah, consume? One hour, I'm like, this is nothing. Look at this fucking guy. He, he's 102 <laughs> years old. He survived it. Jesus Christ, this Stored is crazy. Stored the beach in Normandy. He was a yeah. smoker his whole life, and yeah. he survived. Yeah. Survived the Spanish flu, and then he survived this. And then I'll hear about a 30-year-old guy who's like a spin instructor who's dead. I'm yep. like, what? Well, what the fuck? It's like, which, what is this? Is this this terrible disease that kills healthy people, or is it this one disease that has 50% of the people that get it or more are asymptomatic and they don't even know they have it? Well, it's both. Well, how is that even possible? How is it a disease where a 102-year-old man who uh, fought in World War II gets it and beats it, and then a 30-year-old fitness instructor is dead? I don't know how it is, but it is. It's both that old of those man's things. Hard as fuck, and <laughs> the other probably... dude teaches on a bike that doesn't move, and he sucks on a vape pen all day. <laughs> I was yeah. going to say something else, but yeah, that too. <laughs> probably both of those things. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. What the and what fuck does it is... look like coming out of this? Like, what? What do you? What would you put your chips on? Normal will be at the end of this. Crime infested. Really? My, yeah, my worry is crime. My my, my worry is people that have. No job, no alternative, and they're more desperate than they've ever been before. Like, if we don't take care of that problem in, in terms of unemployment, in terms of some sort of a stimulus check, in terms of, like, they, there could be a significant ramp up of crime. 
Yeah, people forced into that position just yeah. to make ends meet. Yeah, and people that look at the haves and the have-nots and see this clear delineation and just make this decision to fuck that guy. Let's let's take a shit. It's been interesting in Montana. It's, I mean, obviously it's a different state than Cali, but I was born and raised in California, lived the vast majority of my life here, and I can palpably feel people edging closer to, you can go fuck yourself in your rules that you're trying to impose. Yeah. Slowly more people are starting to come out. <laughs> They're doing, uh, they call it the Kalispell Cruise, where it's like, fuck it, we're going to do, uh, just get in your car. We're going to drive down the main drag, and people will sit with lawn chairs and drink beer and hoot and holler. <laughs> <laughs> Shit you not. They've done it <laughs> twice now. How many people live in your town? Ooh, so it fluctuates, summer months, and I'll get, I'm going to get uh, shitty emails and messages. I'm not supposed to talk about Montana or post pictures from Montana. Because, because Mont it's too pretty, and they don't want people moving there. Correct. Apparently, it is directly my fault that the politics in Montana are changing and that certain areas, the property values are high. You are affecting the whole property value and the politics? To some people. The internet's an amazing thing, right? It's equal for all of us, but it shouldn't oh, be. Oh, Andy Stump reads comments. <laughs> oh, no. Sometimes you yeah. do, too, a little bit. Nope. Not at all. Nope. All right. We'll just cut and paste it. Very on. rarely do I see one, like, sticking out as I'm scrolling through pictures or pages. But I do not go into them and go look around. I've, I have on occasion. Like, the last time I did was, like, a couple weeks ago I went. <laughs> and I was like, what is wrong with me? And then I bailed out of it. The most part, I post and bail. And I've gotten really good at it. I've gotten good at it. Like, Jocko gets up at 4.30 in the morning. That's how I do it. Because he do, does it every day. I do it every day. I post and bail. Post and bail. And then it gets to be, that's what I do. I'm I look more at interested comments in, on other people's pages. I look at your comments now. I'm more interested <laughs> in the person making the comment. Like, in my theory on social media, if you really want to fucking torque somebody, like, they'll come out and just be like a flippant cunt. And, I, and I'll just say to them, thank you so much for taking the time to change my mind. Your well thought out and articulate position really is what got me over the edge, have a lovely day. And they fucking lose their mind in orbit. So you just have to be incredibly kind to assholes. Mm. But I, I enjoy I don't clicking. I have that kind of time. I'm not saying that I do either. I'm, I don't think I, anybody has that kind of time. Nobody does, but I'm saying sometimes <laughs> I'll do that. Um, I'm not saying the things that I do are correct or anybody should do anything that I do. But then I'd love to check their profile and see how their life is going. Do you see that the most of the people who talk the most shit are blocked? They have a yeah, private account. Profile. Yeah. With four followers, Bitches. and they're following like 28. And I don't even, I want to see the 28 that they're following. Like there's very certain things that I'm interested <laughs> in. Like, what kind, like, why are you following me? If I piss you off, the same button that you hit to follow also does the reverse action. Go fucking live your life. <laughs> you're, you're asking for logic from morons. Yeah. yeah. So, but so uh, Flathead Valley, I think the whole – so there's Whitefish, which most people have heard of. Um, it's a really nice uh, – there's like the number three ski resort in the U.S. was rated there this year. Kalispell is where I live, which is just south of that. And then there are some towns on the northern end of the – lake and then the southern end but i think it's about a hundred thousand people now and that's spread out over hundreds of square miles that's a good amount of people yeah that's like you have some restaurants you have some shops or retail places but it's not we too have, crazy we got lowe's home depot costco oh. two starbucks whoa two i mean starbucks i don't want to get and a lowe's i don't want to get too highfalutin about kalispell but <laughs> that sounds like a good spot. Is there a university there or anything? There is a community college there. The closest university is in Missoula. Oh. And then there's a- uh, How's Missoula? Mm, I can, I've passed through it. I actually lived there for four years when I was young, but it was in an age that I remember that it snowed and I got in trouble one year for throwing snowballs at a car. That's my memory of Missoula. Mm. Uh, passing through there though, I mean, the whole state's beautiful. But I also live in the western side. The eastern side is much flatter. Because you actually did a – didn't you do a hunting show with Bourdain? Yeah. Did, where were you guys? Well, I've done two hunting shows from Montana. The first one I did with Callan. We yep. were on Meat Eater, and we were in the Missouri Breaks. Okay. That was the first time I ever hunted was in Montana. And then the second time when I went with uh, Bourdain, we were pheasant hunting. And uh, if I remember right, I think we flew into Billings. And then we were outside of Billings. Was it very flat? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, so you were definitely. So I live on the western side where it's much more like where we hunted in Utah. Have you done any of that bird hunting? I have no. Well, shotgun bird hunting? I mean, I would shoot at a turkey with a shotgun. I don't really have any interest in. Yeah. Callan is a guy to me who seems like he'd be an avid pheasant hunter. <laughs> he'd have the right dog. 
He would he, have a perfectly trained dog. Oh my god! I recorded. We did an episode again last night. Making I just play movies for him and get his guidance. <laughs> So he, this is amazing. His number one thing that he thinks should be utilized to clear structures for military personnel is attack snakes and hornets. <laughs> and smoke like bombs. Callen. Yeah, it's amazing. He's, Well-trained eagles. Yeah. But the population in where we live, it triples, if not quadruples, in the summertime. So it, oh. it goes down in the winter. And uh, there's a lot of, well, Glacier National Park, which uh, I have been through been told it, it rivals Yellowstone, but a fraction of the traffic. Really? Yeah. Interesting. And you can see the opening to uh, Glacier National Park. I think that's the, the place to live if Yellowstone blows, which Yellowstone could blow. You want to be right there. Won't that get you us know, all, though, if it blows? Yeah, but you well. want to be right there. You don't want it to get you in a month. Oh, no, for sure. You want your house to vaporize in the fire. Yes, yeah. you don't want to be that guy who dies in that nuclear winter four months later of starvation while, you watch, while you've buried your kids in your backyard in a shallow grave because you don't yeah. have the fucking energy to dig a real hole. And you're doing some like Book of Eli shit, hunting yes, a cat with a bow. Exactly. In- <laughs> yeah, you don't want that, man. Good God. You don't want to be that guy. Well, you know what? So the other thing, like I was saying, the first one that got me was the open spaces – blocked off from people the second one that i just i didn't realize how prevalent it was when i lived in san diego until i went to a place where it almost doesn't exist is homelessness Mm. we were driving around yesterday and i mean i I know that there are homeless people in montana for sure but it's like eight who knows in the summer months i can told it's fuck that's where i would want to be homeless in the winter months no i would be a migratory homeless person for sure but driving around yesterday Seeing people face down on concrete in like the just the most lovely heroin nap, smiling on their face, using the concrete, and then the the tents. We went. I went by one this morning. There was a tent apartment complex with surfboards. Like they homeless people, but they surf at the same time. And uh, I just didn't realize. And and you just driving around yesterday, having people approach you. And I don't have a a lot of experience on people who are using meth, but I would assume that these individuals were. I don't, I mean, I don't know how it got this bad, but I also don't know how to, how California is going to navigate their way out of that. It's a good question, and I don't think anybody has the answer. There's been no clear answer, but I agree with you. It's almost like you need to bail. I mean, my wife keeps, like, as it ramps up, she keeps getting more and more like, we got to get the fuck out of here. Like, what would it take for her to be like, pack your shit, we're going? An earthquake. I don't think she has any idea. I don't think she has any idea what an earthquake is. She's never experienced a real one. She's experienced a few tremors. But if uh, a real earthquake hit, a real motherfucker of an earthquake, yeah. you would see a mass exodus out of this place. This place is so due. It's so due for a big rumbler. It's so due for fires and something that's going to bring down half the buildings. It's well, didn't so didn't half due. of Malibu burn last year? Yeah. Yeah. In my neighborhood. Three houses right in front of my house. Oh, shit, that's right. You posted pictures of the uh, like fire department at your house. Mm-hmm. There was three fucking houses in front of my house that are gone. Did those people rebuild or did they bail? Nobody's rebuilt yet. I mean, I think it takes, um, it takes a while to get your insurance money. Some people in my neighborhood have started rebuilding, but a lot of people are like, we got to get the fuck out of here. Like these, This happens here. I mean, we, since I've lived in my neighborhood, we have been evacuated three times over the last 20 years. Really? Yeah. Fires, all fires, three? All fires, yeah. My brother-in-law is a San Diego City fire captain, and uh, during just a particular season of the year, I think, uh, God damn it, uh, what are they called? The winds, the hot winds that come from the east, Santa Ana's? Santa Ana's, yeah. It's basically all hands on deck, because they know that that's just a tinderbox blowing their way mm-hmm. into the valley. There's not enough resources to stop those motherfuckers in their tracks. Once once, once the fire gets going and starts burning through those hills. Whew. Yeah. Two years ago, I mean, I mean, it's not all, you know, plum drops and roses. Up, I mean, we got forest fires, obviously. And two years yeah. ago, it was to the point where I couldn't see to the end of my block. Really? Just, oh, just smoke sunk all the way down. And a lot of it actually wasn't from the area where I live, it was from fires in Canada and was being blown down yeah, and heard pushed that. into a valley. Because we live in a valley, essentially, the Flathead Valley, and it mm-hmm. just gets compressed and it just sat there for God, about a month. God, suck for your breathing. It was during the opening uh, elk opener in Montana and just walking around. There was a couple of days where I was like, fuck it, I don't care. I'm not going to go hunting. Wow. Yeah, it was that bad. 
wow. like come back inside and you take your clothes off and you come back into the room where the clothes are at. You're just like, oh my god, it smells smell like the smoke. yeah, it smells like you were just. You probably can't see that far either. So when you're glassing, it probably sucks. Hundred yards. Oh god, that's useless. Yeah. Were the elk still bugling? So it's interesting. The elk. I've seen elk. I texted you a picture one time. I've seen elk on my property. No. But I've never heard one because there are so many wolves. So you can go ahead and so bugle. you hear wolves a lot. No, you don't. No, but there's wolf scat everywhere. Ew. And uh, well, you talk to the guys who've been hunting around there. They're like, yeah, if you go ahead and cow call and bugle and see what happens. If you're like glassing up a herd and you do that, they'll pick their head up and be like, hey man, we're out of here because we don't do that in these parts because that's a that's the McDonald's dinner bill. Wow. Yeah. So no cow calls and no bugles. Wow. So I think you'd have to intercept them. That's a weird thing because that kind of changes what elk hunting is. Because one of the things that's really cool about elk, elk hunting is when they scream at each other. Like there's something really exciting about that. Yeah, when it cavitates your chest because they're that close. When Cam and I um, shot that bull that uh, uh, I showed you this uh, video that we did, that uh, he filmed it like right behind me, we had gotten into this rut fest where there was like nine bulls that were going at it with all these cows. They had these cows branched off into like these little harems. And this one pocket of timber was just filled with bulls and cows. It was crazy, screaming at each other. And that's just, the same scenario of the bull I killed after you guys took off. We mm. were, I don't know if it was accidental or the, the guy that had been in that area, the Hell's Canyon area, he put us on basically a four-way freeway intersection of bulls <laughs> and cows. After I shot the bull that I shot, like three or four other bulls still came in and would just sit there and look like 15 yards away just looking at us. I'm just like, what's going on? They lose their mind. Oh, ripping bugles. That trip, the the Utah trip we did, I got, I was frustrated, mind you. I had an interesting experience during that week, but I had more interaction and time to actually watch elk in their environment. Got to see one in a wallow for the first time. Uh, watched one just kicking the shit out of a tree for 30 minutes just raking that thing and the guy was like yeah you can't shoot it but go ahead and try to get as close as you want to you couldn't shoot it because it was too young this is all i would get yeah. for my guide and since this is audio what's you only, doing with your fingers yeah this is what i'm doing it's too small too small too and small. i'm just like if you weren't here i would have shot every animal that we have seen <laughs> yeah they get in trouble <laughs> they get in trouble if the, if the yeah. deseret if uh the animal's under nine years old that was an amazing experience but, but that's why it's amazing because yeah. if they didn't do that, they'd have ever jackass like you and me going down there and launching arrows at all the young buck, all the bulls that got close enough. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know some of those things. Well, and then th I could have had a shot opportunity the third day in there, but I was on his left shoulder and he was trying to give me his thumbs up with his right hand, so I would have had to be able to see through his body to see it. Oh, he's retarded. And just watching this, this and this bull either had just gotten its ass kicked or had just had more sex than it had ever had in its entire life. It was like matted with sweat, just standing by a bush, just like, and I'm just sitting there. I had it ranged like seven times. You know bulls don't sweat, right? No. I don't know what he was doing then. Probably wallowing around in, in water. Whatever he was, he was exhausted. Maybe I'm he sure went, was exhausted, but they, they don't yeah, sweat. Tossed around with the harem for a bit. Took a little whore's bath. But that thing, he actually even looked over and saw us and was just like, eh, just sauntered off. Wow. Fuck. And you had the green light. I had the, well, I was being given a green light, but How I, far away was he? 42. Oh, Jesus. It would have been, and it was a, a slightly uphill shot. It would have been perfect, actually. Ugh. Yeah. There's was, nothing in this life that's like, I mean, I, I don't want to say it's the best thing in life, because I'm, I'm sure it's not. But there's nothing that's like a perfect shot on an animal. When you're watching that arrow arc right into that golden triangle and you see it sink into the fletchings and you're like, it's done. Yeah. That's it. That video you have of Cam filming you was pretty unbelievable. This is the best video I've ever seen in my life. You guys got a touch gay at the end of it? <laughs> we got very gay. We got super gay. I love you. Somebody said, I always wondered what it would look like if Cam and Joe had a kid and we almost found out. <laughs> <laughs> I support that comment oh. completely. Oh, there's man. something about doing something like that, though, that shot. And that was a good one, too, because there's all this hang time because it was a long ass shot. So you, you hear the thunk, the bow go off, and then you see that arrow just slam right into the 
right into the pump station. That was what, 65? 67 yards. That's such an awesome shot. Oh, How do so you good. feel in that moment when you know a shot is coming? Do you start getting amped up? or do Sometimes. You... I don't want to, though. I, yeah. I try to keep myself from getting amped up. But in that one, I just concentrated 100% on the process. I just was not that shaken by that shot. After it was over, I was super excited. But during the shot, I felt very relaxed. I mean, I was clearly elevated, right? I was yeah. clearly... I mean, it was a big bowl, and it was a long shot, and it was a perfect opportunity. He turned totally broadside. Wasn't he slowly walking, too? He stopped. Oh, okay. He stopped. He, t- he had fucked up this other bull. They had gone <laughs> after it, and he turned, and he was going back to his ladies, and he just took a breath, just paused, and he paused in between these two trees. And he just thunk, and watching it sail, 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 and hear the thwock, and see it just go right into the lungs. And I knew it was double lung right away. How far did he go? Uh, he went pretty far. He went 100 yards. It's amazing how far they can go with no lungs. Yeah. They just sprint with all the air they have in their body, and they're so big, and their legs are so long. They can get 100 yards in a couple of seconds, and that's what happened. He went over the top of the hill. He went. He went... He started running. He went over this log and went over the top of the hill and then went another like 30 or 40 yards and piled up. Just just dead. Never stopped. Just just got to the one spot and then tipped over. <laughs> we found mine with all four legs backwards, too. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. It was, it was a quartering shot. I, you can actually hear me on video when it I, – I knew I was going to have to draw back. The thing came into like three yards head on, and I, had, wow. and I hadn't drawn because I hadn't gotten the thumbs up yet. Oh and, and I was legitimately like, okay, what do I do if this thing keeps coming? Like, I was going to go jab and dive out of the way because the cameraman was behind me, and I figured he would take it on the chin. But I knew that, you know, I had two guys with me, and I knew they were going to try to stop him. So I have at least fucked up enough things hunting that I'm like, okay, this is probably what's going to happen now. Mm. So I took my time to draw, and he stopped. But I had, like, this little window in the trees to shoot through, so I'm trying to line up my pins. And when it released... From the angle I was looking at, it was a pretty hard quarter away. I say it on video, I'm like, fuck, it's back. And then it ran over a hill. We looked back on the video, and it was back, but the angle that it penetrated was perfect. You actually want to be back on a real hard quartering away shot. And we could hear just over the hill, it was just like, and I'm looking at the guys, I'm like, is that good? And he was just like, it's good. (laughs) (laughs) The first bull I shot at the Deseret, I had to shoot through this little window. And it was on film. It was like uh, first bull I'd ever shot. I think the first, yeah, definitely the first bull I ever shot with a bow and arrow that I knew other people were going to be able to see it because it was for Under Armour. And uh, Did that tweak you out a little bit? No, no, surprisingly not. I was real focused because of it. I think there's something good about that because I do so much shit on camera. I'm not really oh, worried about doing stuff on camera, but yeah. I was also very focused on making a good shot. But I had to shoot through like. Uh, like a beach ball size hole at 30 yards. I had to punch it straight through. Oh, the hole was at 30 yards? Yeah, this whole, it was all this shit in front of him. There's a video of it. The bull stops, the guide stops it, and I just thread the needle. Whap, and I'd rather have that hole right next to me. I wouldn't want to have to go through that basketball hoop at a distance. Well, it wasn't much choice. Yeah. It was, but it was big enough. It was, you know, a beach ball size. It was big enough. So. I didn't hesitate. His all his vitals were like right Exposed. in the spot. It was a perfect stoppage. Um, Huey, the 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 guide that we use, who's awesome, he uh, Colton Huey, shout out to you. He uh, he stopped it perfect. I mean, he just he just meh, made it made a noise, and it just where he stopped it. It you couldn't have said, hold on, back him up two inches. <laughs> you couldn't have done that. And you where I Getting hit him, put that front arm forward just a touch. If you went up to him and pointed to the spot where you should hit him, I couldn't have hit him any more perfect. It just went right in there. How stable are your pins when you're getting to that moment? I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they're stable. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, it's like when you make a good shot, it's a very, very satisfying feeling. But you're just so concentrating on the process. It's hard to recollect. I remember I did all the stuff that I needed to do. Like I said that on when I did that video with Cam. I said I just concentrated on the process. I centered my peep. I checked my bubble. And, and I put the pin on them. And I just pulled my back. And, yeah. and I was using a silver back too, which I really, really like for high-pressure situations. Because you really have no idea when it's going to go off. 
And because of that, man, I mean, I know a lot of people like a thumb trigger, and I've used that too. Like I used that in the Under Armour thing too. The that the video was a, one. Are you no? I used the uh, first choice, the three finger one. I like the three finger ones. Is it a similar concept? You mean with the thumb yeah. release? You can still yeah. fire with back tension, but your exactly. thumb exactly. Okay. My thumb just sits on it, and I'm pulling it with my back. But you can flinch if you if you're if you just like go now and you hit it with your thumb, it will go. Whereas <laughs> it won't with the silver <laughs> back. You, the last thing you want is to be that go now guy. Right, that hit it now. It's the terriblest feeling when you know you've done that and you miss. Yeah. Oh, you feel like such a, even a target. If I shoot a target like that, I'm like, what the fuck? I'll go back to like a hinge release or I'll go back to a back tension for months and months and I won't touch a thumb until I know I can use it. Now I'm really confident I can hunt with a thumb because I know that I have a process in my head. I don't just shoot. I have this whole process where I make myself go through these steps so I don't fuck it up. Yeah. And I fucked up enough that I'll rigorously stick to that process. But there's nothing like those back tension releases. You take all that out of the equation. Like you're not, with that silver back, you're just using tension. You're yeah, not, I love that thing. You're, you're not thinking about anything else. Just I usually do like 95% of my practice with that, but I usually hunt with the knock to it because I like to be able to hang it on the D-loop. That's really the only I thing that I- I because it bangs around when you're going through the bushes and shit. And what if it falls off? I like to keep that fucker. I'll right, put my second one on there. Right in my bino harness or right in my pocket. Yeah, yeah, I have a second one too. I, I have hunted with the silverback. That first black bear I killed was with a silverback. Mm. Yeah, I wonder if they'll let us hunt this year. I know, right? Have you thought about that? I have thought about that. Yeah, I would. I think. I mean, what about? I mean, Montana. They make a ton of money per year on non-resident tags, mm -hmm. and I'm curious. What about outfitters? I bet you mm -hmm. they're not sitting on cash reserves that can go multiple seasons without hunting. No, 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 not at all. Yeah, what do they do? Yeah. What do you miss the most? Comedy what? clubs, for sure. Out of all the stuff that you do, is that your favorite? Yeah, if there was one thing that I couldn't, if I if I could choose one thing that I, I had to abandon all the other ones, it would be comedy. Because I feel like podcasts, I could always do somebody else's podcast and have a good time once a week or once every month or whatever. And as far as the UFC, I'm just – I enjoy it as much watching it at home as I do calling. And, in fact, probably maybe a little bit more when I'm doing, like, fight companions with yeah. Callan and, and Eddie Bravo Well, and you guys Shaw. only watch usually between two to three minutes yeah. of the fight. We're having fun. <laughs> but the live experience is a job. But yeah. it's also – you know, it means a lot to me, like, to be able to do that job, like, to be able to give – words to incredible moments where these guys are having these insane fights and to to try to illustrate how spectacular it is and enhance it for the people at home but i don't have to do that other people do that real good you know there's plenty you of do it pretty good i actually have gone back and watched some of the older ufcs and uh i didn't realize how much i didn't know until i started training mm. and now because if you don't know what you're looking at some of the shit that happens is invisible it, right, until sure. you explain it, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, I remember when that son of a bitch did that to me in the gym the other day. Like, <laughs> I understand why that hurts. Yeah. But, man, I didn't realize how little I understood about the micro exchanges that are going on or just positioning and the pressure. Mm -hmm. Fuck, man. Yes, particularly with jujitsu on the ground. You know, that's uh, one thing where people who don't have any experience in grappling really don't know what they're looking at. Striking is kind of like the guy hit the guy with the elbow. The guy hit the guy with the knee. Like that kind of like you can kind of see. Yeah. You kind of get it. You don't know how he did it. Like wow, how that guy hit him like that. But you know he hit him, and that's why the guy got hurt. Whereas with submissions, it's like what happened? Yeah. Like someone gets someone in the calf slicer, and you're like, what happened? Why would you tap to that? I'm like, come here, yeah. oh, shit. <laughs> bro. <laughs> um, uh, Charles Oliveira got a guy in a calf slicer in in the UFC, and I remember thinking, look at this motherfucker. Like wow. Just so painful. It feels like your knee's gonna explode. Your shin's gonna snap. Yeah, the bicep slicer is not much Ugh, better. I hate that one. Yeah, because I feel like there's a small window where you know, like when you have it, like you know, you, you put it across the arm and then you triangle it. It it seems like as you're pulling, you triangle it. There's a small window here where this thing's gonna snap. Yeah, Vinny Magalhaes just got his leg snapped. Did you hear about that? Craig mm. Jones. Oh, just I did had a hear match about this. Vinny Wasn't this Mister Hashtag Leg Locks Don't Work? Uh, I think he had something controversial to say along yeah. those lines. And then didn't he melt his fucking leg due to the same thing he was... I think he probably <laughs> said that, that they don't work on him because, like, Craig Jones is a famous leg locker. Oh, yeah. If he did say it. I don't know if he did say it. I'm pretty sure he had, leading up to it, is 
somewhere along the lines of hashtag like leg locks don't work on me or mm. fuck leg locks. Well, now we know. Yeah. He's got a broken tibia. You tibia, know, tibia or fibula? One of the It was a spiral fracture, right? I don't know. Yeah, I heard, I'd heard that his uh, foot was visibly pointing in a direction that a human foot should not be. Craig Jones sent me a, a message so we could see it if we want to see it. Okay. He 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 let me know about it and uh, uh, he sent me a direct message on the Instagram. <laughs> I highly support his choice of uh, leopard apparel when he's, he goes into the ring. He's a funny guy. He's a very interesting guy. So this is, uh, yeah. That oh, okay. It's images. This is uh, as he's cranking on it. That's the first image, and then he's he I snapped it. I can't. I don't know yeah. about you. Well, you sit ringside. You actually you said it before. You've probably seen more people get knocked out than uh, probably anybody else on earth. I'm okay if it surprises me. I don't like to go and like let me go look at YouTube for motorcycle wrecks. <laughs> like I, that fucks me up. I, if it happens in front of me, I'm like, oh damn. Or if I don't know what's going to happen in the video, I'm fine with it. But right. it turns my stomach if I actively go and look for that shit on the internet. Well, it probably should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people do. Like, how about kids? Imagine being a sixteen-year-old kid with an internet account. Sixteen-year-old kids with an internet access and a YouTube account that are just jumping on and watching all these videos. You can fill your brain up. I with have some a horrendous 16 shit. Sixteen and fourteen-year-old boys, uh, and I think they're you know broken. Well, well, from the browser history <laughs> might leave a mark, you know? <laughs> it's Animal attacks. There's so many animal Ugh. attack videos now. When I was a kid, it was hard. It was hard to find a guy getting attacked by a tiger. Or it's hard to find a guy getting mauled by a bear. Are the guy's face missing from the oh. bear? That, and then, of Jeez. course. How about him talking? I know. He's talking. You know what fucks me up is like 100 people will send that to me. Like, why do you think I want to see that? Because they're in your neighborhood. Those same bears. <sighs> well, that's Have you okay. seen one yet? No, actually, I haven't. No grizzlies. I uh, no, but there is a grizzly <laughs> at the ski resort. It's telling about in whitefish. They have a run called Hell Roaring on the backside, and they have to close it down a touch early because there's a grizzly den right there, and they got to shut it down before she comes out. <laughs> Holy fuck! Yeah. Holy fuck! Imagine if she comes out while you're skiing. You imagine just... you're coming down, shh, and you see that oh, head pop out. Oh, I can, I can one up you on that. Uh, I don't know. I think it was a few years ago. There was a downhill mountain bike rider. So the ski resorts in the summertime, you know, they'll carve in the paths so people can just rip down on these multi-thousand dollar mountain bikes. Uh, I don't know this person uh, directly, but I know people who knew him second and third hand. He came ripping around a corner and hit a fucking grizzly bear, oh! which then took his head off. Killed him? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Just happen. Well, there's huckleberries all over that mountain too, so they're just feasting in the summertime. Oh my god! So he had, the bear probably thought he attacked him. And I, oh. from my understanding, it was like a blind turn and just at velocity straight oh. into. Ah! The, can you imagine that? Oh my god! Yeah, you would bounce off that thing like a like a gnat. That's it's so fucked up. That's why I don't do downhill mountain bike ride. I like safe shit. That's a good move. I mean. I guess you're a safety first kind of guy. I I've do. Always, safety I've is always thought primary. That about you. Yeah, primary. Hey, I've backed way off a lot of the shit that I do. No, you haven't. Yes, Last I have. time I talked to you, <laughs> you were saying some guy broke your record of yeah. the flying squirrel suit, and you were like, I'm like, are you going to break it? You're like, of course I'm going to. But what I want, well, see, the problem with that is the airplanes all go up to the same height. I want to get like a helium balloon and go to 80,000 feet in a wingsuit and then send that sucker, <sighs> which would require like a partial pressure space suit. Dude, you're making me nervous. Actually, you know what I'm digging? Why do you want to do that, though? Oh, I won't. I mean, I can talk shit. I, to be honest with you, the skydiving is extremely easy. You know, um, the wingsuit stuff is actually extremely easy. You, it Gravity works. It's been tested since before Newton had an apple fall on his head, if that ever actually happened. But it's also easy for things to go really wrong. Not really. Particularly the wingsuit, no? Not really. For people who are on the front leading edge of, you know, uh, creativity and innovation, maybe in the wingsuit design, or they're trying to do something crazy, I would say people who are trying to be the new YouTube sensation, are they're probably at a much higher risk level because of what – I mean, there's so there's videos of people flying their wingsuits, and the wing of it, you, you know, you kind of extend your arm, and you're, there's a gripper that's – probably three to four times it's like it's like a harry potter wand and you gently hold it in between your fingers and you can deform the wing a little bit so the wing 
extends slightly out from your finger. There's videos of people dragging wingtips in snow on mountains. That's how close that they're flying. I mean, what the fuck could you possibly do? You know what I mean? Like, what's next after that? You're going to land the thing on your belly? And I have no desire to do, like, they can go try to do all that all they want to. Like, I could give a shit about that. I enjoy being in the outdoors. I do love base jumping. I do love skydiving. But I try to do it as safe as humanly possible. Okay. And it's I haven't, like, I haven't I, jumped in a while, actually. I ride bulls, but I ride bulls with an understanding of what could go wrong. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's what you say. And I have a conversation. I hum to the bull first. You know, I do everything that I can to manage just, it. I'm aware. You know, a lot of guys are reckless. <laughs> yeah. I, I know where the danger is. I'm like, yeah. No, it's, I mean, I'm, I've been around enough incidents that have happened in those environments and lost enough friends that, I mean, I get it. I understand the consequences to it. And... My risk reward ratio has shifted. Like one of the big things that I would actually rather do now is jujitsu. It's, I love it. It's fucking awesome. Yeah, we were just talking about that. I'm banged up and injured, and I haven't been able to roll for about a year, and I can't wait to get back. I well, can't wait to. How much were you rolling before that? Um, over the last year, not that much. The last year before I got injured, because I was, I was, in, I've been injured perpetually over the last like three years. Whereas shoulder injuries that I had to get stem cells for, a lower back injury that was causing me to have some sciatica, a um, bunch of stuff, knee stuff. There's like always something. And when you hit my age, I'm 52 now, it, I don't know anybody who does jujitsu that's my age that doesn't get a bunch of surgeries. They all or get like they disc- change their training patterns or their training partners. Pretty, You'll see people like, nope. Mm-hmm. Not, you know. Say no to savages that just want to fucking go to war every day. Some guys just don't roll light. They just want to go to war. They yeah. just always want to go to war. And it's fun. I get it. But uh, it's fun going to war if you fucking win. Yeah, but <laughs> the, the, it's also just, it's not even if you win. Because even if you do win, you still hurt yourself. Like the, the, the sheer numbers. You know, I started jujitsu in 96. So just the sheer numbers of training sessions over all those years, it just. I know so many guys that are fucked up, like yeah. to the point where they have like one atrophied arm because they have pinched nerves and their nerves aren't signaling to their biceps. Like, I know a couple guys like that. Did I they know- train through the warning signs? Yes, everybody does. Yeah. They all do. Yeah. Men could be the dumbest species on the face of the planet for sure. for sure. But that's also why we get shit done because <laughs> we figure out a way to push through things. It's like a, it's a catch-22 because you don't want to – the kind of person who – pussies out every time they feel a little pain they never get anywhere but then you have to know when you are not being a pussy but you're actually being a good body manager right so you've got to know and know this is actually an injury you have a a torn ligament you can't do this you have to back off you were telling me before you were a head and arm triangle guy i love those but they fuck your neck up they fuck my neck up the recipient's neck or the person mine i developed a bulging disc in my neck on the side because I was pushing with the right side of my neck because I oh, would get it. Oh, kind of like point loading yeah. your forehead in? Spoiler alert, I always get it on the right arm. <laughs> <laughs> I get it on the left arm sometimes. Too. I've got them a few times on the left arm, but there's a big difference between- Your white belt my, side and your black yeah, belt side? my black belt side is my their right arm. I always found myself attacking that it's right arm. Their right arm. Okay. Yeah, so it's their right arm. When I would get that pinch down, I would I have a strong neck, and I would use that as like the third arm all the time. And I was developing a bulge in my neck because of that, and that started sending some weird uh, signals down my arm where I would get pain in my elbow and, and numbness of my fingers. And it was because my, my disc was pushing against my nerve. And then... Not tapping to guillotines didn't help, and not tapping to rear naked Guillotine's shows. Guillotine's a savage one. Ugh. Get on the old little oh, yeah, upper the on the trachea. Yeah, you tap, and then you're just like, I'll <laughs> yeah. be over here for a second. Well, the, um, there's there's some you know some fucking Darce masters out there that would show you something that's even grosser than that. I understand it's, the Darce. I struggle with that one. Well, you have good length arms. I have, I have short, stubby arms. But um, when you have long arms, like a Roger Gracie or someone along those lines, like those guys. Because you can get it in yeah. and then finish it over the top. Tony Ferguson is one of the best that I've ever seen. I actually watched a video of that. He was getting it standing, and it was mesmerizing he to me. He catches it from everywhere, too. He catches it in scrambles. Like, anybody who fights him, you have to be – like, he he did it to Edson Barboza in a bloodbath of a fight, right? Crazy fight, blood everywhere. And in the middle of the scramble, he has Barboza hurt, and he sinks in this Darce choke. 
like in the third round when they were covered in sweat and blood. And can't he? Doesn't he finish it from the bottom, the top, the side? All the time. Doesn't care. All the time from everywhere. He's got an amazing. It's like it's funny how some guys has just this one technique that just is so sharp. Like um, there was Cody McKenzie. I don't know if you remember him. He was on the Ultimate Fighter. Sort of like this wild dude from Alaska. Looked like he just uh, stepped off of a bar and smoked some meth Oil and wanted guy, to fight. Yeah. yeah. But he had a crazy guillotine. Crazy. He caught everybody with it. Everybody knew it was coming. Still got him. They called it the <laughs> McKenzie-teen. It was amazing. I would watch him catch. And he wasn't good at other stuff. I mean, not, not that he wasn't... Ba- he wasn't bad at other stuff, but he wasn't like that with other moves. He's just one move that he just had. Like, if you got caught in his guillotine, you were fucked. He just had it polished. Could people get out of your head and arm? Yeah, some people got out, but more people didn't. Do you finish from the top, or would you go to the side? Oh, I'd go to the side, yeah. I've, but I've, I've finished people from the mount. I've finished people from full side, where I go around like a clock arm, counter uh, clockwise rather, and then I've also finished what they they would call um, I forget what Eddie called it, the impaler. That's what it was. The impaler is, and this was a really good one. If someone was doing that defense, there's a defense that guys will do where they wrap their own arms around their leg, and uh, they can kind of push with their leg, and it gives themselves some space, and uh, it keeps you from cutting the blood off. But oh, you, it frees one side. Mm-hmm. Right, but you can you can beat that by what's called the in, in, impaler. And when the impaler is, you get the head and arm, you clamp it down, you get yourself in position, and then you move your knee to their sternum. And then once you have <laughs> the knee and the sternum, then you just fucking crush. You crush it down, and it it forces them to defend that pain. It depends. It's a battle. You know, if the guy's really strong or if he's bigger than you, you might not get it from there. But um, it, it is a significant counter to that defense if you can get it in there. Because, you know, you got to think that arms here and the arms, the two arms are wrapped around that thigh, right? You slide your knee right in there and your knee plants right down on that sternum. You just fucking I've, crush. I've already, I've already tapped in this scenario. <laughs> it, and you get a guy like Jocko on you oh, doing something like that. Everything's just going to go pop, pop, pop. Those ribs will go. Eddie Bravo did it to me once and I thought I was going to lose all my ribs. Like I was like, okay, try this, try try when I defend, and he he got his knee in there and put the clamp down. On it him. was just like, over. Holy fuck, it's so painful because that's if you if you have good base. First of all, you got to assume the guy's not fighting your base, right? If he's doing that, if he's if he's doing that, he's committed to to defending in that position. He's not going to be able to hip escape or buck, yeah. right? So he doesn't have use of his arms. So if he doesn't have use of his arms, I feel like I can commit much more to crushing his rib cage. Um, he's not going anywhere. You know, he's not even trying to go anywhere. He's he's admitting the fact that I've got him fucked. So he's trying to hang on as long as he can. But that leaves your whole rib cage open. And you just crush, crush it down. I'm not, some, I'm not interested in any move called the impaler. It's a horrible feeling. I, I hate I hate it when he does it to me. Yeah, it's I'm, awful. I'm fascinated by the levels that it's mm-hmm. it's just unbelievable. Um, I worked a little bit with Henry Akins. He had me over to his house. Henry's of, great. Fuck. But yeah. he, he moves like the control. He's big, but the control and the ability to t- apply pressure to a pinpoint location. He's like, he was like, he put me in a uh, scarf hole. Let me work on your, uh, you know, your case of Katami. So I, he lets me put him in there. He's like, okay, I'm going to tune it up a little bit. Let me, let me do it to you. And I was just like, oh my God. Mm-hmm. Well, he's a Hicks and Black Belt. Correct. You know, that Hicks and Gracie lineage is the basics of. The, the I should, shouldn't even say I don't like the word basic. Sometimes can give people the wrong opinion. It's the fundamentals. The fundamentals razor sharp, sharpened to an impossible edge. Like if you see Crone, if you see and Hodger's the same way. You don't see any crazy stuff. You don't see anything that you don't see. You know, in uh, a, a jujitsu match from 1993. It's like all those standard techniques. It's just they're they're polished. To this impossible shine, and you know, they just know how to do all of the the fundamentals so perfectly. And there's an interesting there's an interesting lesson to be learned there. It's like, what is more important? Is it more important to have an arsenal of techniques that you can hit from any different position, or to have seven or eight techniques that you do so well that you could def- you could tap some of the best black belts in the world with them? 
And that's uh, like that's the Hodger Gracie approach. That's the Salo Hibero approach. Rafael Lovato, those kind of guys. They you don't see like wild, crazy, innovative stuff. You see the, the a, a, a fundamental base of jujitsu that's just out of control with its complexity. Yeah, Henry had some stories about watching Hickson train with other people, and I would I'm. I won't even try to remember the names because I'd fuck them all up. But essentially, I think he said he was a purple belt. Yeah, um, uh, Henry was. And he would watch these guys come in who were like the apex of the sport jiu-jitsu competition, jiu-jitsu circuit. And I, I think he was saying – Hickson was at the point, I think, where he was kind of battling some injuries as well too. Like they were catching up with him a little bit. So he wouldn't have a uh, pretty robust level of training underneath him at that time. And he would just run – through these people. And he told a particular story about a current world champion where Hickson just tapped him to side control top. And the guy spiked his black belt in the garbage can on the way out the door. (laughs) (laughs) And and Henry said nobody, like they were, he was partnered up with another guy who he described as like his arch enemy. It was like purple belt on purple belt murder in the corner. Mm. But then they caught out of the corner of their eye that Hickson was rolling. So like, we're we're done for now. We're going to watch Hickson roll for a bit. And I guess he got him with something first, and then he didn't see what it was the second time. So Henry said he stayed afterwards. It was just like, what happened? I didn't see the second submission. He's like, side control top. Just the fucking pressure. The current world champion. That's so crazy. Yeah. Because that's like a meme. There's a guy sitting down with a girl, and she goes, tell me about yourself. And he goes, I tap from pressure. <laughs> <laughs> And then the next picture is the guy by himself and the girl's gone. I support it. Yeah. yeah. It's a fucking hilarious meme for jujitsu people because, you know, tapping from pressure is that's uh it takes a lot to yeah, get some Yeah, but there's some people out there. I rolled oh, yeah. with the uh, the founders of Origin, Pete Roberts. He's a large man. Oh, Origin um Geez. Jocko's yeah. company yeah. up in Maine. So they had me out there. I was a uh, I, I was still I've still been doing jujitsu less than 2 years, but I remember I had my white belt at the time. And he's just fucking toying with me, obviously. You know, he's got a bunch of stripes on his black belt. Large man. Fuck. He's like, you ready for some of that black belt pressure? I'm like, no. No, I'm I'm not. I'm good. (laughs) Get off me. It is interesting, the levels, right? You know, like, and then you would see a guy like him, if he rolled with a guy like Roger Gracie, I guarantee you he would have probably a similar situation happen. It is, it's weird, man. And then these new guys that are coming up, I mean, it's just like... People are constantly elevating the level. These guys like Gordon Ryan and Gary Tonin and Craig Jones, and they're constantly elevating the level of what we think of as like top flight jujitsu. What are those guys? I mean, I guess you'd have to speak for them, but I hear a lot about the talk between the fundamental jujitsu that you were talking about and the new school jujitsu, which I can't mm. even define really what new school jujitsu is. I don't even have enough experience for that. A lot of it's leg locks. What are your, I mean, what are your thoughts? Like, uh, cause I know Gordon Ryan, I know that name in the Craig Jones and I actually know them both because of hearing about leg locks and just watching the crazy contortionist stuff to me that it seems like they'll do to get in there. But as soon as they have it, it's over. Mm-hmm. I mean, that would be considered new school, right? Well, new school is certainly John Donaher's stuff, Eddie Bravo's stuff, Craig Jones. There's, and it's all whether it's gi or no gi, because that's that's you know you got to make those distinctions. And the the gi game is very complicated too, because there's so many different grips and holds, and so many. I mean, it's very technical, and the people who really love the gi think it's way more technical, and that there's more. Even Marcel Marcelo Garcia, who's famous for no gi says that no gi revol- it, it evolves a lot it revolves a lot around uh, physical ability like your athleticism your strength your speed no gi does no gi does it's a big factor like a lot of wrestlers can go into no gi and do very well really quickly yeah that doesn't surprise Nikki me Nicky Rodriguez is a young guy out of New York i think he's like 23 who is uh, beating a lot of world champions and beating them by decision or taking their back and stuff. But he's just a really big, really strong kid who's a wrestler. And he's able to scramble and and beat these guys like Cyborg um, and beat them because he's just a better wrestler, just a bigger, stronger, faster wrestler. You gave me some good advice. I think it was about a year ago we were 
chatting and I was asking you about your percentage of gi versus no gi rolling that you do. And you said you, when you roll in the gi, you still don't take grips. Yes. And I've done a port. I mean, I struggle with that concept in the middle of a roll because I would do, I do mostly gi because that's a lot of what the school is. And it's tempting mm-hmm. to like, here's a car door handle. Like, yeah. I want to hold on to that. But specifically when I, like if I'll start standing and somebody else has started seated, I will constantly tell myself not to close my hands. I try to keep my grips open and it's A, save my grip. But I think it applies. It has helped me. It will apply it more to the no gi as well. Yeah, I like I like gi for defense. What I like with with gi is it makes me really concentrate on my defense because I can't pull out of things. You can't just explode because I feel like when you're slippery and it's no gi, there's so much you yeah. can get out of just a quick explosion, a quick movement. And that's when you deal with a guy like a Nicky Rodriguez, like a big, fast, explosive kid. I think I know who you're talking about. He's a beast, right? Just huge. Match. Yeah, okay. Huge. And he's in that Gordon Ryan school, too. Uh, he's uh, one of the uh, Henzo guys. So the he's Dan a John Donner. Squad. Yeah. So all those guys are all coming out of that same. I mean, what a goddamn lion's den that place is. <laughs> so, I mean, so many top level guys have come from that spot. I just love Dan Hurst coaching. He's amazing. Side. I just love how he does it, though. Mm-hmm. Gordon Ryan, back exposure near side. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I like, like an oh, evil shit. genius. <laughs> no elevated speech tones. Of course, first and last name. Yeah. As if anybody, the other person would confuse Dan or her talking to them. I know, Because right. it's probably getting coached in Brazilian, in Portuguese, whatever the fuck they're saying. Imagine how terrifying it must be to hear Donaher give someone explanation of how to choke you. Yeah. And you're like, shit, he's going to follow it and he's going to get me. Back exposure. Back. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gordon Ryan, back exposure. I will say, though, he should wear more appropriate attire outside mm-hmm. of the studio. I Jiu-Jitsu like the studio. fact that he wears a rash guard everywhere. He I wore heard a he rash guard a wedding. to Matt. Yes, I was going to say that. Matt Sarah's wedding wore a rash guard. Now, let me ask you this. Did it have a uh, bow tie on it? Was it one of like the Good tuxedo question. t-shirts? Because that I would actually be okay with. That's fairly classy. It is classy. And at first look, people might be like, oh, fuck, he's dressed up. Yeah. <laughs> but he's also ready to roll. Or maybe he wears one with just a big heart in the center of it. Just like he's there for love. Callan's got some funny stories about Tanner. Does he? Yes. He, that dude, you sit down and talk to him. He's been in some weird rooms with some very high level people. Callan? Yeah. yeah. Observing yeah. more than participating, but still he's there. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's lit a, he's, I don't know anybody like Callan. He's led a strange life. That's, that's the understatement of the day, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> he's m- <laughs> my longest running friend in Los Angeles. Did you guys meet over comedy? We met, uh, he was on Mad TV and I came in as a guest. And uh, that was in 95, maybe? Something like that? 95 or 96. And we were we've been best friends ever since. Yeah, he's a good dude. He is uh oh god, we were watching this horrendous TV show last night that I had been thinking about since we watched it because it fucking bothered me so much. And uh he's he's like an incredibly empathetic person. Like he doesn't want to hurt anybody. Like to I know. A, to a fault. Like he'll <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's great. And he's getting upset at the TV show. I was just yelling at the TV. He was just getting upset internally and probably weak being in the corner. But it was, you know, uh, I think the show, I don't want to even say the name of the show because I don't want people to watch these dumpster fire of just garbage TV. But essentially, you know, you had a limited amount of time to get a visa to get married. And these people are obviously getting just catfished. Completely, utterly, and on. And they're like, you know, I lost the love of my life. I was married for 30 years. I found love again online. And his name is Willie or whatever it is. And it's a dude who's just like, it's a model. He's like, it's from England, but his camera doesn't work on his phone. So I've never really seen him. <laughs> this type of show, right? And you're like, and as I'm explaining this, you're looking at me, you're like, who the fuck would ever fall for this? Well, there's seven seasons. So that's who would fall for it. There's plenty of people. You got to realize that a lot of that's fake. Uh, a lot of those reality uh, shows, they, they kind of know they're supposed to play stupid and they edit around stuff that doesn't. Yeah. I think they cast well for this one. I there think, might be an essence of it being fake, but also, I mean, there's a reason that the Nigerian scammers exist, right? They're catching yeah, somebody. They're catching a lot of people. Actually, one of these women went to Nigeria because she was going to marry a Nigerian uh, uh, rapper, Soldier Boy. <clears throat> and mm. I, I'm just sitting there and I had the same reaction occurred from every family when the family got read into what was about to happen. I, hey, I'm going to go to, one guy was going to, I think, the Philippines, and his daughter was like, what? 
And then the one lady was telling her <laughs> daughter, I'm going to go to England and meet this guy. And she's like, what? And they all sit down and try to talk the person out of it, but they won't have it. Fistful of red flags everywhere. And they're just like parting those red flags to see. And uh, it's just like, and Brian's like, he's heartbroken for them. He just, he just kept saying, I feel so bad for her. Do we have to keep watching this? <laughs> <laughs> he's such a sensitive snowflake. He's too sensitive. And I say that in the best way. When when I met him, uh, we, 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 we both grew up very different. And um, when I met him, he was surrounded by all these bullshit artists. And I remember like all these different guys like, yeah, Mike's going to produce this movie. And, and Tim's going to produce this TV show. I go, no, he's not. <laughs> Like, you're around bullshit artists. These guys are full of shit, man. It's like, no, yeah. oh, no, he's a good guy. And slowly but surely he figured it out. But God damn it, it took forever. Well, like, you guys all are the into, people that I called. You're into town of that, though. I don't know how the fuck you guys operate in this environment that you're in. Which I'm not saying that everybody is bullshit artists, but I suspect that everybody wants something. Yes, but we're comics. And comedy is that there's no I've better seen you in a movie, meritocracy. Joe. I've been in a couple of movies. I know, but there's no bigger. But I've only been in Kevin James movies because he's my friend. <laughs> there's no bigger meritocracy in show business than comedy. Because if you are not funny, they do not laugh. There is no. You can't fake it. You can fake music, man. They can put auto tune on your voice. You can get somebody Millie else Vanilli. to write the. Yeah, you get some even better, right? They they literally didn't even have their own voice. You can get other people that will uh, write for you, other people produce the music, they'll change your voice and post, you'll be fine. But in comedy, no, it's only truth. You, you, you either are funny or you are not. What's the worst it's ever gone for you? Oh, terrible. No, I mean, like, do you remember, like, oh, one yeah, I can event? Name hundreds of them. <laughs> Fuck, terrible bomb. I've been doing comedy for 31 years. So terrible what do you do? You, just, you look at how much time you owe and you just go? You just eat shit and cry and, uh, <laughs> and, and go back home and try to figure out what went wrong. And the pain is so bad, you never want to feel it again. The way I describe it, someone says, what's it like to bomb on stage? I go, it's like sucking a thousand dicks in front of your mother. Except there's probably someone out there that likes sucking a thousand dicks in front of his mother. There's no one who likes bombing. No one likes bombing. So it might be worse. Ugh. I mean, I would rather bomb than suck a thousand dicks in For front sure. of my mother. Yeah. But it might be worse to bomb. It might be worse. It Can you be. feel it early, too? Like as soon as you get up there, do you know if there's a disconnect? The crowd? No. I mean, sometimes yes, and sometimes no, and sometimes it's you, and sometimes it's them, and sometimes it's just a series of events that take place, and sometimes, you, you know, you could be in a bad mood. Like, you, you learn that the audience, it's not, they're not just dependent upon you saying the words right. They're dependent upon you being in tune with what you're saying. Like, you have to really believe what you're saying. You have to be focused on what you're saying. You got to be in the moment. It can't be hollow. Those little animals can smell you. They smell you. They know when you're full of shit. They're like, this guy's not even thinking about this. He's just saying it like he's thinking about it. It's like a hypnosis. <laughs> That's what comedy's like it, in a lot of ways. It's like mass hypnosis. But it's a, it's a, you're trying to, you're not trying to trick them into something, but you're trying to talk them into a certain state of mind where they will allow you to take the reins on their thoughts and you will drive the thoughts and they'll allow you if, if your writing is good and your concepts are good and you're making them laugh and you're making them feel good they'll let you take them on a ride and uh if you don't if the ride's bad they get really mad at you that's the reason why bombing is so painful because comedy killing is so good so the op it's like killing feels so good that bombing is just the worst feeling of all time. Is and it that, tough to sit there and watch somebody else bomb too? Oh, some people love it. <laughs> some comics love it. They go look at him eat shit. This is great. Like my friend Greg Fitzsimmons, he can watch people bomb, and he just he just he'll just die laughing. He just can't he can't help himself. He loves it. He thinks it's hilarious. Hey, at least somebody in the crowd's laughing. Yeah, he's ra laughing for his right reason. <laughs> yeah. But for me, it's I don't enjoy it. It just I've had uh experiences on the road. This is a real problem in the early days before I um could take guys to open for me. I would rely on local openers. So say if I was going to work in Florida. That's got to be some variable. Oh, you ain't seen nothing. 
I'll be uh, working in Florida. Florida is the worst place for this because the comics are so bad. <laughs> the local comics in Florida, it's like, you know how places are known for having like a shit level of something? Yeah. There's no high level comedy in terms of like local comedy that anybody's aware of in Florida. I, I could be wrong. I mean, I heard there's like a little bit of a scene in Miami now, like some comics are putting together some shows, but the traditionally, if you were doing like the improv in uh, Tampa, and you showed up to do that. You were going to work with the worst fucking acts you've ever worked with all year. And you'd be like, oh, my God. Does and that set you up for yes. failure? Okay. Yeah, that's the problem. What I was saying, if someone bombs, I don't mean to single out the improv in Tampa. But if somebody <laughs> bombs, but if somebody bombs, you think nothing's funny. He's like, no one can be funny. It can't be done. Comedy, comedy doesn't work. Like you have to be out. You have to not know they bombed. And then you go up there fresh and loose. But even then, because you got to be in the room when they're introducing you. So if you're watching the guy's closing bit, and it's just this fucking Fuck. diarrhea spectacular <laughs> of a joke. I've been around so much bad comedy, and it's, it really does set you off in a bit. you got to dig the audience out of a hole, because the audience is mad that you've done this to them. Like, the audience is mad that you've made them listen to this guy before you. And pay think, for it, probably. They think, Yeah, and they think it's your fault. Also, they're they're not convinced that you'll be funny because they've been just tortured for the last half hour. And that that is, ugh. No, that thank you. No. Yeah, you guys can have all that. No. Well, you know, the, the, if you understood the reward, you'd get it. Like if you, like, I do do agree. So, I, like I, I do a bunch of public speaking, and there mm -hmm. are times, it's not comedy, even though I it, pretty much every time we'll say at least something that's wildly inappropriate because but that's just But when you do me. that and you get that rush. Well, you when you connect with the whole audience and you can t like you'll and I've been at places where they have speakers come up and you know 5 minutes in people are just like looking at their phone. Oh. And then when you get up there and the like the economy of words is really good and your thoughts are flowing really well and everybody like you can just look around and be like, "Oh, everybody's actually paying attention to me. I'm actually nailing this right now." I, I would imagine that's a fraction of a percentage of what you guys are feeling up there. It's, yeah, you're probably not even in the neighborhood. There's I understand thing, the thing connection, about the though, laughs. I guess. The connection, yeah, but there's a thing about the laughs. Like, there's something about when you hit a, a punchline and you get a roar. It is a drug like no other. It's a weird drug. It's real weird. You guys should make fun of veterans more. Um, I was talking I with Count about this too. I don't know anybody who does other than Bur Bill Burr has a really funny bit. He did a little bit. Yeah. But it's, I was telling Brian, like, this is an underserviced population that you guys should start swinging for the fences on. And it's going to wildly irritate a lot of people, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be made fun of. I can only make fun of things that I would want to make fun of. And I don't want to make fun of veterans. Like, what if to I told you a bunch of fucked up stuff off air about veterans? It would only work <laughs> if I was a veteran. Like, I can make fun of Italians because I am Italian. You know what I mean? If I was a veteran and I had some funny shit to say about veterans, but I wish as, there was a you veteran are a, comic. But the thing is, you are a veteran. I'm sure there is. There's a bunch. Don L. Rawlings is a veteran. Like a modern day, like post 9/11. Yes, I don't went. Don. God, I hope he's up there just crushing. Don L's hilarious. He's really funny. But it, there's got to be. There's got to be more than him. That's a that's a veteran. There's there's a bunch of veterans. I'm sure. I'm sure there are. But I can't. It's, my feelings on it are not that. <laughs> my feelings on it are of respect. It's like if there's anything fucked up about that community, it's not It's not in my wheelhouse. I only have so many things I can say about veterans, so I choose to only say good things. You know, I don't have that much to – see, you're shaking your head, but that's you. You're in that world. I'm just going to write you like a small novel about things that you could talk about. You could pick and choose from them or just throw them away. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> no, I get it. I can only make fun of things that I think are funny. Like, I don't ever pick something and go, hey, I think I can make that into a joke that will work. I never think that. I think, what is that asshole doing? Like, why would you do that? Is that where it starts then, for you in that oh, creative process? Almost always, like, this motherfucker. Look at this dipshit. <laughs> look at this dumb fuck. Like, it's always almost, it's usually Ugh. like I hear a story online, you know, either like watch a video or hear a story or something will happen to me or I'll see somebody do something stupid. It's almost always coming from a position of look at this fuck. <laughs> That video you posted today, that the internet is undefeated. Isn't that amazing? I was crying. I was fucking <laughs> crying in the green room. And, and, I, and the thing is, I was crying an uh, hour ago when I was watching it at Cowan's. Like, every, like, the fish hitting the lady and the way. 
This gun is on fire. That one was one of my favorite. The perfect catch of the fireball or the Michael Jackson uh, coming out of the helium uh, balloon yes. explosion. <laughs> The fucking Russian dude with the the electricity. Oh, oh. When he actually he hits the fence. That one took me. Dancing. That one took me a second. I'm like, what's going on? I'm like, oh, he's dancing to it being electrocuted. That's amazing. <laughs> oh my god, I literally had tears coming down my face multiple times today. Uh, I'll go watch it again tonight. Uh, I'm gonna do it. It's an amazing video, and uh, the way it's edited. I wish I knew who edited it so I can give him the credit, but the way it's edited where the girl is walking out of the water and she's looking so sexy and so sleek, and then she fa- You don't know what's happening. And then when she falls, it begins. <laughs> yeah, because it opens with... It's a few seconds in before it actually begins. Nah. I was like, what did you just post, Joe? And then I was... <laughs> I had to restart it because I couldn't see through the tears. I was laughing so fuck. The electrocution one I actually think might be the best. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> It's amazing. It's an amazing video. I just, uh, that's what I love about the online, about that. The memes, the just the funny shit that people are creating. Like the I tap to pressure. When it, when would you ever have a joke like that <laughs> that would work on people yeah. that only do jujitsu? Like if anybody who sees that, like you and I just laugh really hard at that. Yeah. But the average person's like, what does that mean? That's not going to mean anything. Oh, for sure. It won't work at all. Like where it kills. Works for, for us. us. <laughs> it doesn't do anything. <laughs> See, that's, but that's also like why I can't make fun of veterans. Like, it's not, God, it's not in my sense of humor. See, the problem is people don't think what I think is funny is as funny as I do. You say that, but I bet a lot of people do. You just would know. have to find the people that do. That's the thing about comedy. Like, Instagram my comedy takes down would... the shit that I put up that I think is funny. <laughs> I found shit. two videos of people shooting themselves in the face, looking down the barrel. And Instagram took them. Apparently, it's a violation of some. I have an entire Instagram page where all I do is make fun of people with guns. That's all I do. You have a separate Instagram Fuck page? Fuck yes, I do. Shh, don't tell anybody. Most people know about it. Uh, your boy Uri Favor was featured the other day. Was he? Did he shoot something? Point a fucking pick pistol at Michael Bisping's head. <laughs> was he really? Yes. Why was he doing that? Because I don't think he knows much about guns. Oh, my God. No, He's I, around a lot of guys who do, though, which is weird. Like, you actually were the impetus for the beginning of this page. I was. Uh, two years ago when I came on and we were making – you asked me what I thought the most accurate uh, military movie was and I said Navy SEALs. And you're like, no shit. I'm like, no, I'm joking. We made fun of like <laughs> Sicario for like 20 minutes. I, and so that's how you got into it. No, I literally created – it's tactical asshole actual. Oh, that's right. So that – in the military terms, like if you're on the radio, like every unit has a call sign. But there's an officer in charge and he could be like, hey – Trident 2-0 actual means the ground force commander is on the horn. So it's tactical asshole actual. I have Steven, uh, Steven Seagal is the only person I follow. <laughs> <laughs> and the profile image is Charlie Sheen from Navy SEALs with the telemarketer fucking headset. <laughs> so telemarketer. Did they ever use those in the field? The no. Telemarketer it's an headset? actual telemarketer's headset. So in that movie, he's actually got a telemarketer's yeah. headset. Yeah. Do you have any idea that uh... that thing would respond to sweat or water? <laughs> Oh, my God. I get or wind. probably 50 sub- – I don't even have to look for material anymore. I get like 50 submissions a day. So a guy sent me a video <laughs> of a dude with a rifle in between his legs looking down the barrel, like pushing on it. And he has – he's from a Middle Eastern country. He has one of the little hats on. And all of a sudden goes boom and the hat flies off and he falls over. So two hours later after I was able to stop fucking laughing and see my phone again, I posted and Instagram disagrees with my sense of humor. Can you send me that video? Oh, I fuck yeah, I'll send you that yeah, video. <laughs> airdrop me that. <laughs> I get mad when they take down videos that are awesome. Well, I think it's from, it's obviously a complaint. Yeah. But you'd be amazed the stuff that's on that page, like people holding pistols to their eyes and looking down it. Um, <laughs> I'm not amazed. Oh, dude. It's, I'm not amazed. It's unbelievable. And then usually I'll do Steven Seagal Saturdays and just talk shit about that tubby fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember when he had a television show where he was a cop? Uh, so the tactical asshole episode I did with Brian last night, we reviewed some of that. <laughs> yeah, Steven Seagal, lawman. Yeah. Where he's teaching marksmanship and he says, like, it. the sequence opens with him reading from Sun Tzu. The five, and he's like, yeah, many officers have a way to get their head straight before going in the field. and So do I. And he's lighting incense, reading from Sun Tzu. And then he, you know, he goes and makes an arrest on a meth head. Literally is walking up to the guy with his pistol up. He's the only guy. Now, mind you, most of the time when I watch stuff like this, I I don't watch the individual. I'll watch the people that are around them 
who are casually strolling up. All of their guns are holsters, right? Not Mr. Seagal, who's walking with it up and pointing it down. It, well, he's just like, well, he's, I guess he's like 6'5". But there was another officer in between the suspect. So he's putting it over the officer's head? No, he's just holding it like a fuckstick. <laughs> like he doesn't know anything. But he's, And then he, there was another one where he was giving an instructional video. Like, I just want to pass on these techniques that have made me a master shooter. And I know a guy who worked with him directly for three months. And one of the first things that he did was go to his compound or facility and was doing marksmanship training. And this dude has been on multiple combat deployments. He's like, that's the most dangerous shit I've ever done in my fucking life. (laughs) 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 The guy was just like, ah, what's... He's just like, (laughs) oh my God. And then he worked with him as a technical advisor (laughs) and rehearsed like he was there. And the director, they had some sequence, you know, taped out and... I guess Seagal did it, and the director's like, God, this sucks. I'm like, where's the tech advisor? Why'd you do this? And he's like, I didn't do that. That's what he wanted to do. He's like, well, I'll put together a scene for you. So he works with him, rehearses with him for like four hours. He's like doing tactical reloads and a lot of stuff that doesn't exist in most of the movies. And he said, as soon as the uh, director said action, he just completely did his own shit and just forgot everything he was supposed to do. He was doing like combat roles and just like, ga, 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 ga. And he's just done. And, <laughs> And my buddy Brian's like, what the fuck, man? He's like, I just feel like I had to do it my way. <laughs> <laughs> He's a silly guy. Yeah, I mean, that's a polite way mm. of putting it. Did you ever see when he was teaching Anderson Silva? I know he was went to a UFC with him, right? Oh, no, 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 no. They trained. Come on. Yeah, was yeah, he yeah. actually teaching Anderson Silva something? No. No, okay. no, Anderson Silva has a, an amazing sense of humor. And okay. Anderson Silva was a huge Steven Seagal fan. All from, right. Look, when he was living in Brazil, he would watch those movies as a kid like we all did. I did as well. I did, yeah. I watched Above the Law. I fucking loved it. Well, the guy's a huge movie star, right? And Anderson Silva grew up. So when he says he wants to train with Anderson, and it's like, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Come on, teach me things. So he let Steven Seagal be with him in his training camp. He let Steven Seagal be with him backstage. He, he had Steven Seagal showing him how to throw a front kick. So when he front kicks Vitor Belfort in the face, like Steven Seagal's like, I taught him how to throw that kick. I told him, I told him, you throw that kick. <laughs> And when, like, it's the first kick you learn in martial arts. It's so crazy. He said that he, he, he was taking credit for Lyoto Machida landing it on Randy Couture. He's like, I told him if you throw that, it'll land. I go, oh, you just knew? If you throw it, it'll land? Well, why doesn't it? Why don't you just tell that to everybody? If you throw it, it'll land. What is this, a karate kid? The fuck are you talking about? I, I worry about people like that. God damn it. He was really good at Aikido, though. Like, legitimately. But what does good. that mean, though? Well, that's I know question. almost nothing about Aikido. Well, to preface that, if a guy's coming at you with a sword and he doesn't know that you know Aikido, you could do some stuff. Like Aikido is, it is absolutely a legit martial art that was created to disarm people with sticks and knives and 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 people that have swords. So the idea is, if a samurai loses his sword and someone's coming at you, you can. Take advantage of the fact they're overcommitting to a thrust or a swing, and then you get to their body, manipulate it, and use that energy and throw them to the ground. Everything <clears> you <throat> just said makes sense. Yeah. If it's the 1600s. Yeah, that was when it developed. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Have pre, you ever had somebody pre, come um, after you with a sword? Not, not yet. Me either. God damn it. I wish they would. I have one right there. I know. Just in case. Yeah. But, I mean, okay. <laughs> so, since we're out of the copper age. <laughs> What the fuck? It's not a good martial art if you know martial arts. If someone knows martial arts, what they would basically do, first of all, if someone just knows Muay Thai, they would just take your fucking legs apart. They would just chop at your legs, push you away, chop at your legs. And if you clinch with them, they're so used to sweeps. And so, used, I mean, m- one of the beautiful things about Muay Thai is the, the ability to manipulate guys in the sweeps and throws. So you're not going to get them off with some crazy nonsense where you're going to grab their wrist and bend it down yeah. and all the shit that he does in the movies won't work on a Muay Thai guy. It definitely won't work on a fucking wrestler. A wrestler, you, you try to that some 
Aikido shit on a wrestler. A wrestler would probably hope that you are an Aikido dude. Oh, so they'd be so happy. They'd, I, I actually <laughs> talked to an Aikido guy about this, and it was the most hilarious thing because one of the things that people would always say, like if you back in the day when I used to go on um, mixed martial arts forums, they would say, uh, oh, if he tried that shit on me, I'd just sidestep him. And it was a joke. And it was a joke because that's what like people that don't know a fucking thing about martial arts think <laughs> they would do if you came at them. Come at me, bro. I'll just sidestep you. Like, because morons have said that. So we would say that as a joke. Should have just sidestepped him. <laughs> that was like an inside joke. So I'm actually talking to this Aikido guy. He's like an Aikido master. And uh, we were talking about wrestling. And I go, well, what would you do if like some college wrestler was, was coming after you? He goes, I would just sidestep him. <laughs> And he was dead serious. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, you don't even know what you just did. I was laughing so hard. And he was like, what is so funny? I go, you don't even know what you just did. What you just did is what everybody who is hopelessly lost in an actual altercation says before an altercation. I'll just sidestep him. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. You don't think you could change, change fucking angles that he attacks at? You are helpless if an NCAA All-American oh, grabs a hold Gets of you. Gets his mitts on you? Oh my! You didn't have experienced that kind of physical fucking strength, and and the ability to manipulate bodies the or way the speed with which oh, they move. Oh, oh, Jesus! Especially some real elite top of the food chain Jordan Burroughs type character. Like good lord, some Mark Schultz in his prime just g grab a hold of you and drive you through to fucking China, right through the core of the earth. <laughs> I almost think that if you have that background, you need to wear a sign around your neck. <laughs> Well, you almost see it on them. But, like, you know, you'll see, I've heard horror stories of people starting jujitsu with that background, and they show up there at white belt, but they got crazy cauliflower ears, and people are like, what's going on over there? Yeah. <laughs> you need to wear a sign. Well, they feel like wood. Like, that's the thing. Like, you start rolling with a guy like that, like, what are you made out of wood? Like, they, they, they're so fucking dense. Like, the, the kind of muscles that you get from manipulating bodies your whole life. And some of these fuckheads have been in, like, wrestling camp when they're five. Yeah. And here they are on their 24, and they're like, oh, I think I'm going to start going and trying out jujitsu. <sighs> their, their neck starts at the top of their head and goes down at a 40-degree angle. <laughs> they grab a hold of you, and it's like, I guess when you're done with that, I'd like to have it back. Yeah, what? <laughs> so when's the UFC coming back? Well, we have a fight next weekend. I'm flying to Jacksonville. Is this on that? Oh, no. It was going to be on some mysterious island, right? That idea got... Supposedly that island's real. All right. No, they, but they it's not being... going to happen there, right? Not this card. The island is for international cards. Will there be an audience at the one you're going to? No. How do you think that Cam be? Cam Haynes wanted to come with me, and I was trying to get him to come with me. He could not come. They would not let him come with me. Really? Mm-hmm. They have to limit the amount of people in the arena. <clears throat> they have to uh, limit the uh, amount of people in the corners. Um, I'm going to be doing it with Daniel Cormier, the commentary, and John Anik, and I don't even think we could be anywhere near each other. Can you be near the ring? Yes. I'm okay. going to be right next to it. Oh, but they might put you guys on yes. different sides? We'll probably, you know, it's an octagon, so we'll probably be in, d in different sides of the eight eight corners. How do you think that'll be for the fighters? I mean, I, I having never... Weird. Yeah, don't you think... That, I mean, do they feed... Do you feel them feeding off of the crowd? or For sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Although... The uh, last event that they did, they did like that from Brazil, from Brasilia, Brazil. That was the Charles Oliveira, um, Kevin Lee fight. And there was no crowd. It was very interesting. Yeah, that's got to be a surreal experience for those guys. Yeah. Actually, I think I saw a clip of that. You could hear the, <clears throat> uh, the mat of the octagon much more than you normally would. Yeah, you hear everything. You hear everything. You hear the, the, the corners. You hear all the instruction. And Gilbert Burns knocked out uh, Damian Maya, and when he knocked out Damian Maya, he's yelling in an empty arena, "Poha, poha!" <laughs> Just screaming out. And it's like, wow, that's so weird. It's so weird to hear him yell that out and an echo through this empty arena. I wonder how long it'll be before they will let people back in there. Depends on where, and it depends on what happens right now with Georgia, because Georgia's opening shit back up. And it depends what happens in Florida. I'd say Florida. you guys could come to Montana, but I don't think there's any arenas. Well, do we really need an arena? I mean, if we can get a 2,000-seat theater and put an octagon in a theater, it'd be great. I don't even know if there's – I mean, I don't know about the theater scene in Montana, but I don't, I don't think there's a 2,000-seat theater there. I think there is in Billings. Billings the big city? Oh, man, I had this conversation <clears throat> not too long ago. What's the biggest city? I think it is it's, – it's either Billings or Missoula. Oh, so Bozeman's third? 
Is Bozeman third place? The the largest cities that I know of are Billings, Bozeman, Butte, Helena, Missoula, Kalispell, and Whitefish. Those and are. I think Billings is the big one. It might be. I think. But big one, I mean, in relative terms, we're talking about the population of probably <coughs> three square blocks from where we're sitting right now. Yeah, there's a million people in the whole state, right? Let's not undersell it. There's 1,007,000 people. Oh, That's seven right. extra thousand. We're getting up there. Mm, it's getting big. And I'm not allowed to say that because, like I said, I'm a Cali transplant. So, mm. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> Do they accept you? How many years do you have to be there before you're? Uh, 40, I think. <laughs> Do you have a, a, a Montana license plate in your car? Oh, yeah. yeah. Montana license plate, Montana license. That was the first thing I did because it was the gateway to my concealed carry permit. Oh. Six months of residence. And, uh, you know, the laws are different with guns up there. You can, Purchase takes about five minutes. Mm. Then you leave with it. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Same, same day. Yeah. Well, they kept all the gun stores open um, during all this here and there. What are your thoughts on the number of people standing in line for guns who weeks before would have probably had an issue with the Second Amendment? Fucking hilarious. Yeah. It was hilarious having conversations <laughs> with my own friends about it, where all of a sudden, my, my friend Alonzo Bowden, who was just here before, never had a gun in his life. Now he has two. Bought them because of this. And he goes, well, what happened to me was the purge went from being a movie to a fucking reality show. And I'm like, all right. I get it. Problem <laughs> is the old waiting period. Well, also the problem is they were all talking shit about guns just before yeah. that. Did he buy ammo with the gun? I believe he did. He bought I a hope forty-five. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. He bought a forty-five, and he bought. I don't have the COVID, by the way. I've been tested. That's a marijuana. Seasonal cough. allergies and cold still exist. That's another one I that, get. Yeah. So does the flu. <laughs> yeah. They don't take. But that's just uh, marijuana. Um, uh, I think this is my, my take on it. Is. <sighs> I think it's good that people realize that there's a thin layer to this civilization thing and that it can be punctured really quickly. And so when all those people were in line waiting for guns, I was like, okay, maybe maybe we won't have to hear too much stupid shit from people that are generally, generally left-leaning about how you don't need guns anymore. I don't want to hear that shit because now that I see these lines, I know a lot of you fucks are Democrats. In fact, one of my best friends is about as liberal as can be and his wife is a fucking super hippie. She's like, you're never bringing a gun into this house. Boom, the shit goes down. Get a gun. You need to get a gun. She tells him to get a gun immediately. Yeah, uh, but he, does he know how to use it? Oh, he doesn't know a fucking thing about it. That is actually probably more unsafe than, yeah. you know, like that's guns. I t well, actually, let me tell you something. He shot guns when he was a kid. That, that's a, that's, I'm thinking of a different guy. He that, definitely shot guns when he was a kid, so he knows a little bit about how yeah. to use a gun. He's not trained, though. People think that guns just instantaneously solve problems. I I describe them as a Harry Potter wand. You know, They mm. think that they can just, ah, look at you know, elixir or whatever the hell they say in Harry yeah. Potter. It's, it introduces more problems than people think. Oh, yeah. And, and having a, a gun, gun in, your, in the house. Well, here's, right, so you know where they should have been standing in line after purchasing their gun? At the store that sells the safe. Yeah. Because if you don't have somewhere to store it, right? You know, and people are like, oh, it's for my protection. I'm like, yeah, it's designed to kill, though. And anybody who says that guns are designed to protect is just being intellectually dishonest. Right. They protect by killing or the threat of killing. And you can say that without weakening your argument for having them. Right. But maybe treat it like that. Yeah, but the way you're saying it scares people that don't like reality. <laughs> I don't know how to say it any other way. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. <laughs> That's part of your appeal. But yeah, that it, but that saying that to some people like I've said things like that to some people and you know They look at you like you're a fucking caveman But I already have that problem anyway, you know, it's like you it is what it is And if you don't know that the world has terrible people in it I don't know if I could tell you that in a way that's gonna make you believe it and that's gonna convince you You almost have to see that things can fall apart so you that you understand it, it Yeah which is unfortunate because not everybody comes out of that okay. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think, uh, man, I think we're getting a real good look at how mentally tough some people are in comparison to what they thought, how resilient they are. Oh, yeah. People are getting pushed up to a metaphorical edge or a literal edge, whatever that might be for them. And uh, it's some interesting times for sure. Yeah, I talked to my wife about this, like some of her... Um, not friends, but people that she knows from like school, like some people are like, they're not handling this well. I think a you lot know? of people are not handling it yeah. well. 
Yeah, a lot of people. A lot of people are really clamping up and panicking. It's and a lot of people have never experienced. Not only have they never experienced real adversity, they never thought it was coming. They didn't think it was even a, a possible item on the menu, and then all of a sudden, you there's no toilet paper. There's only <laughs> one package of ground meat. My friend said that to me. He goes, "Dude, I went to the supermarket and there was one package of ground meat left. That's it." I go, "Did you get it?" I was going to say, "Did he buy yeah, it?" Yeah, he bought it. Good. But I go, "Listen, you come here, man. I got I shot two elk last year. I got, got about a lot 400 of pounds of elk yeah. at the house. I give so much meat out to people. Like, uh, if you can get one elk a year, you're pretty good. You could kind of eat that thing for a whole year with a small family." Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's where I live, so I live south of Kalispell by a bit. I live my house is on 20 acres that overlooks that lake that I take pictures That's of. That's so nice. Well, I just chopped down a bunch of trees too to improve the view. But I have I have everything that I need out there, so I don't need to actually go into town to experience a lot of what's going on. It's very bizarre to sit there and think about where I am and how things are going for me. And then places like New York where you got 9 million people stacked on top of each other. With no food. Or it's, even just driving around, it's amazing how fast I forgot how compressed everything is here. And how preposterous it is. Oh, for when, sure. Whenever I go somewhere that's not preposterous, and then I come here, <laughs> and I'm like, what am I doing? I think ultimately, the, I'll, I'll definitely bail. Ultimately. Would you bail full-time or part-time? Ultimately, full-time. But part-time, like, I could just keep my house or keep apartment or something like that here <clears throat> for, I mean, if I ever needed to come here for business reasons. This is all dependent upon what happens with stand-up comedy, because this state is so goofy. Like this, the governor got shot down. He was trying to shut all the beaches down, and he was trying to, but he got shot down today. Yeah. And I, we were talking about that earlier that they were well, all they're flirting them. with people legitimately protesting and probably yeah. you know just saying no, fuck you, we're going to do what we're going to do. They're flirting with violating the constitution. I mean, that's also what they're doing. Yeah, you know, it's like you're denying people the choice. You're saying that you know better, and I don't think you do. And and I and I also think that what you're saying doesn't line up with the statistics. If you look at the statistics of what is what is the percentage of people that are dying that get it, and it is very small. It's still awful that people die. It's still terrible if it's your grandma. We still have to protect the sick. We still have to protect the weak. We still have to protect the old. However, you can't tell me what to do. And you, you're you not my dad, and you're not the emperor. You're a fucking governor. And so if you think you could tell people they can't go to the beach when they're 10 feet apart from each other, you think some magical fucking property is going to allow all these people to get sick and bring it home and transfer it, you're saying that they're not smart enough to do that. But yet you're also saying they're 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 smart enough to drive. They're responsible enough to drive and drink and do all these different own things. Own guns. And own guns, but they're not responsible enough to sit down on the beach 10, 10 feet apart from their neighbor. I don't think you know what the fuck you're talking about. I don't like it. I don't like it, and I'm not buying into any of this tracking shit. If they come into this fucking this this tracking software they're talking about, where they're they're you know you're COVID free, we just need to mark your phone. You yeah. bring it everywhere you go, and every time you come to a checkpoint, bring your phone. Like, fuck well, you know, they you. already have the ability to do that, right? They have the ability to do that, but widespread implementation of it will not be accepted. It'll only be accepted if you can have some fucking reason. <laughs> you're like such a COVID. sweetheart, Joe. You're such a sweetheart. You think it'll be accepted? I think they've been doing it for years. That's not what I mean. I mean, if you make I think people been... bring their phone everywhere. You, you don't, don't have to. You don't you even don't... have to make people bring their phone. They're, go they're addicted to it anyway. And I think the stuff right, but that you they're... don't have to. Here's the thing. There's a big thing oh, between you're... being addicted and have to. In China, you have to bring your phone everywhere. If you yeah. do not bring your phone everywhere and show that you're clear... You're not getting in anywhere. They're talking about implementing a similar strategy here. They're also talking about how they did that in South Korea. And South Korea said, we are going to give up some of our rights and some yeah. of our privacy in order to protect ourselves. I say, fuck you. Yeah, I didn't know that they were going to force people to bring their phones. What I was, My point was they've had the ability, and I bet you they have been accessing data from people's devices like that, the connection, the proximity, all the stuff that the sensors are able to do on the phone for a long time. I'm sure they have. I'm yeah. sure they have. I'm sure they probably, with the testing, there's probably some way they could flip a switch and, and put some information into a database and they'd know who's got it and who doesn't and where they are and where they're going. Hey, this guy turned positive and look, his fucking phone is all the way over here in downtown LA when he lives in Pasadena. How is this, how is this happening? Yeah. That's that's possible. The news is tripping people too. I watch people who are obsessed over that uh, the coronavirus pandemic tracker on like Fox News. It lists the number of cases, but and but people will watch it 
and I and I want to scream at him like, do you understand that the information that comes in informs how you behave and how you think of the world? And like 90% of the shit that you're looking at is negative. It's negative this, negative that, negative this, negative that. And it's not helping you make any decisions. And by the way, that number's never going to go down. Can we agree on that? It's going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. How is that helping you live your life? And you look at these fucking models, like Dr. Peter Atia, I know you know him, Yeah, wrote a blog post. It basically reframed how he felt like a month ago. And he in it, he broke down the math that they're using for these projections. Mm-hmm. And in he changed one of the digits by a tenth of a percent. And it was changing the outcome by millions. And they're not even sure where the actual integer is for that. I think it was the number of people that a sick person can potentially infect. It's like 2.3 or something like that. If you put it at like 2.4, it increases it by like 2 to 3x. If you put it at 0.1 less, it dra- – like so these models are like a shotgun blast oh, all wow. over the place and nobody knows because I don't think we know. No, I don't think we know either. And what we do know is that there's way more people that have been infected than they ever previously thought. Yeah. And that's what they're finding out from these antibody tests. And they're like, oh, my God, this is way more prevalent. We didn't really stop it at all. And it turns out a lot of people get it and nothing happens. A lot, like more than half get it and they don't even have a symptom, which is so weird. That is bizarre. It's the weirdest fucking disease ever. Is it a disease or a virus? It's a virus. Okay. Yeah. Does but it turn into a disease? I mean, I guess pneumonia is a disease, right? I don't know. I, I had heard people, people pneumonia. talking about that in both terms. I didn't know which was actually the correct Well, heart disease and lung disease have most certainly come from this. There's people that have developed heart disease because of this, heart attacks because of this, a lot of strokes. It's weird. It, it's so different in different people. Yeah. Um, and different with different blood types. You know? I don't. Montana is not sucking during this time. The color on the map of Montana is good. Yeah. Like all the hot spots. Yeah. There are, there is, it's certainly, it's even in the Flathead Valley, I think they said there was 50 cases. That's hilarious. Yeah, I think there's been Pro- four. Everybody walked it off and kept farming. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, I don't feel well. Gotta go uh, feed the horses. Yeah. Man, that's the life. That's the life that everybody, like what, the way you, when you show those pictures off your back balcony, that is, uh, that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants that house by a lake. That really is the life. Because if you can get that, like, every day, like, everything else would be better. Like, if you're if you're in a fucking apartment and you're looking out into a parking lot and there's a car with no tire and fucking some bums yelling at another bum and that's your life, that's not as good. Unless you're an incredibly social person. It works well for me because social distancing is one of my favorite activities. Yeah, but you're social, too. I'm social to you're the just people. just not social with assholes. I don't, yeah, well, I think almost everybody's an asshole, so... <laughs> I'm only. Well, you like me. Yeah, but I like you're not you an too. asshole. Well, there you go. I, See, just, I, I've heard it described. I'd rather be a, a mile, I'll be a mile deep rather than an inch. Or how does it go? Uh, I'm deeper rather than wide when it comes to my friends. Yeah, that's that's a good way to put so it. So I have a small group of people that I, I definitely enjoy being social with, but I also would not mind ever not talking to anybody other than those people. I'd be okay. But I, th- I know people the opposite of that. They need like 50x the social interaction that I do. You're also a person who has these people in your life, in your circle, that you guys have this one unusual thing in common with. Like, of course, you have your jiu-jitsu people. That is very unusual world. You have your wingsuit people, very unusual Normal world. world. Normal. It's the term we use. And you have the SEAL people, very unusual world. So like the circles that you travel in, also those three circles are all filled with extraordinary human beings. Like you, you can't be a normal person and be a SEAL. You can't be a normal person and be a, a wingsuit world record holder. You can't be a normal person and excel at jiu-jitsu. Most people quit. They're not interested in getting their fucking neck strangled and their arms stretched and their fucking knee brought behind their back and fuck that. They quit. I'd say you could be normal in all of those, but the farther you go, the more it deselects for assholes. Yes, yes. Deselects for people with flaws. Deselects for people that have a distorted perception of reality. Deselect for people who can't learn. You know, people make excuses for things. Yeah. 
Yeah. Bow hunting is another one. It's another really, I mean, you're in, involved in that too, right? Yeah. Very small circle. Yeah. Especially the type of bow hunting that you do, mountain yeah. elk hunting and shit. Like, man, you got to be in shape. You got to be driven. I mean, think about what it was last year when you, I mean, I remember the look of frustration on your face when we were like <laughs> day four and day five. And, and then you, you realize like, man, this is getting down to the fucking wire. Oh, I had assumed I that I was going to, yeah, I was assumed I was going to leave there without it. I was so happy when you got it. It's so nice. It's like that, when that arrow slammed in and you, you eventually recovered that elk, that must've been the best feeling ever. The best feeling ever is when I crested the two foot rise that had separated me and where the bull hit the ground. And I saw the glow of the hide. I was like, thank God. <laughs> Let's yes. get this thing off the goddamn mountain. Yes the best feeling i just hung that euro up uh last week actually nice johnny utah little point break nice. but also deseret action nice yeah god i i'm all about european mounts too i don't like those regular mounts i don't like them at all i at love all. the look of yeah. a clean european mount well it's also the real animal it's not a fucking toy like those fake eyes and the fake nose and stretched over a piece of foam. Like, what are we cosplaying a live animal here? Like, what is that? I wonder if they could do that with a human. Oh, they definitely could. But Today? It, but would it look real life? Well, my friend Whitney has a robot that is that they oh, designed yeah, I've heard for you her guys talk comedy about special. This. Yeah, it was really weird. It looks a lot like her, but... I mean, it's also not a million dollar robot. Like if they could do, do a million dollar robot, I bet they could make it look just like you. Like those wax figures. You ever been to one of those wax museums? Where I've they, only seen them from pictures. If they can make it look so much like the person, it's bizarre. Like it takes a little bit of time to look at the picture and determine who's real and who's yeah. not. Yeah. They could do that with you. I would just want to fuck with people, man. That'd be yeah. the perfect opportunity to scare the shit out of people. Well, if you were the type of person that, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean- I mean, I think in the future, there's going to be no stopping people from making artificial people. There's going to be a version of you hanging around that's not you. Well, I, I'm I'm 100% convinced of that. Like in our lifetime, you think? Yes. Imagine. <laughs> listen to this. Imagine <laughs> if you're married to a gal and uh, you think she's hot, but she's annoying, and so uh, you have her constructed. You have a robot version of her. You break up with her and you keep fucking the robot that looks exactly like her. I mean, exact. Feels like her, but it's really nice. It's really sweet. And whatever you say, Andy. I love you, Andy. And she's like, you can't do that, you fuck. And you're like, what are you talking about? This is art. You should take it as a compliment. Look, we're not compatible personality-wise, but I love to fuck your robot. So I bought the robot. You know, kick sand. This is a fucking free country. You're deep down in a mental <laughs> rabbit hole that I never probably would have gone down myself. But How many celebrities are going to have robots oh, of them fuck. out there that guys are just oh. mouth-fucking all day? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be some, some celebrity, like Je some Jennifer Aniston type. Some Scarlett some, Johansson yeah, model out exactly. there somewhere. Yeah. Some untouchable A-lister, and some guy's got her head in a vice, and he just... <laughs> <laughs> And that's what she looks forward to every day. She puts herself in the vice. She cranks it with a smile. Oh, God. Yeah. What was that? What is it? Uh, Deuce Ex Machina, that movie? Yeah. I watched that Ex off. Ex Machina. Deuce Ex is, uh, that's a different thing. That's actually a video game. But Ex Machina is the, yeah. yeah. I, I watched that movie after hearing you guys talk about it one Fuck. time. Fuck. That'll, that'll fuck you up a little bit. That movie's good. Yeah, it's very good. That movie's good. good. That's a really, really good movie. It's one of those movies where there's not a whole lot of cut the shit scenes. Yeah, according there's not to, a lot of bullshit in that. According to programmers, the only cut the shit scene is the idea that this this guy's out there doing this by himself. They were like, "Listen, you would need a thousand people working on one one of those, and you would need the a thousand of the the best minds in the world because this is not in some future era. This is all happening right now. Yeah, They're like there's no way. That's so. It's one of those things where it's like if you look at someone in a film that's doing some tactical asshole shit, you're like, what the fuck is this? You know, that's how it's pretty they, much how I watch movies too. It yeah. drives people nuts. Well, that's how AI people look at that movie. They're like, yeah, you, yeah. For me, for someone like me, I go, wow, that's so realistic. But for them, they're like, there's not a fucking chance in hell that guy's doing this by himself. We to cheer ourselves up last night after watching the uh, catfishing show, we watched the beginning <laughs> of Extraction with whatever uh, Thor his. Whatever. Oh, is that the Chris Helmsworth? Is, that, <sighs> is it bad? What a fucking dumpster fire. <laughs> Someone was just telling me it was great. I think it was Jamie, my producer, was telling me it was great. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk to Jamie after this. <laughs> 
I'm sure it's great from a cinematic action perspective, but I mean, I was like, I, I'm going to bed. Like yeah. I'm out. I can't watch this. Well, stuff. I'm really excited for the Jack Carr series. I'm really excited what what he's going to be able to do. I, I haven't been able to listen to the episode, but I was stoked to see that you guys connected. Dude, that book is great. Yeah, Savage Son is great, and I didn't read the other two. Yeah. I only I, I listened to it on tape, the third one rather. I didn't read any of it, but um, it's amazing. I've had him on my podcast twice. We started buds together. Oh. Yeah, I have a repetitive uh, lower back injury from carrying him through fucking training. <laughs> Has it's been horrendous, and then I carried him through his entire career, and I'm taller than him. He's a great guy. He's man. awesome. He's a great guy. He's a real exceptional person, and I and I and I, I love what he did. Like he really went into detail about how he dedicated himself to his writing. He basically took the same approach that he took to his military career. Identical approach. Yeah, yeah. just like do the work and do it right and, and bust his ass. And he told the whole story of how he got it made and how he did it, and it's it's an amazing story. It's amazing. It really is. And it's really good. I mean, I'm not just saying that because I love the guy and I think he's awesome. It's yep. a fucking great book. I've read it too. And uh, I, both times talking on the time I've had him on my podcast, he's like, I wanted to be two things in life, a seal and an author. And all he did was put his nose to the grindstone. Like People think it takes some incredible feat of intelligence or heroism or whatever to be like to be a seal. Specifically, I don't have a fucking clue about being an author because I'm never writing a book. But it's not. You grind your ass off, and if you don't quit, at the end of the day, you get a little metal pin that doesn't mean shit in the totality of things in the world, and off you go. What's amazing about him, too, is that he didn't go to school to learn how to write. Yeah. He didn't take journalism courses or take courses in literature. He just read a lot yep. and just always wanted to write that kind. I mean, that's his style that he enjoys reading, that sort of action, political comedy, yep. you know, or, or not comedy, uh, drama. Um, uh, just like really good stuff. Like the way he writes is like, you don't, you see it all happen as he's describing it, but it, it never makes you go, what, why did he do that? Like, it's really, really well thought out. And it's probably more accurate than most people think. Like he put a lot of his personal experiences, I've known him, like I said, we started buds together. He was not mentally or physically strong enough to finish with my class, which is fine. That's a different ah. topic. But <laughs> it's fine. It's, it was the hardest buds class ever on record in the history of SEAL training. But uh, he put a lot of his experiences in there. So what people are reading, they probably don't realize how accurate it is. And a lot of it is very accurate. And he, I mean, fuck, he went to you know Russia to research some, and he put the time and effort in. And Shot a bear in Russia. We yeah. were talking about that on the podcast. Crafted the life yeah. that he was looking for. And, you know, people will look at that and, you know, the classic, you know, Cam Haynes must be nice, you know, dick comment. I mean, I've known him for a long time. His life is far from perfect. He's got some, you know, uh, issues, uh, health issues, you know, with his family. Like, it's not been roses for that guy. He was doing all of that stuff while working through and supporting. And, like, it's amazing what he's been able to do. Yeah, he's a man of character. And that, that really comes across in his writing. You know, it's it's great stuff. I love that kind of film, right? And so I'm really excited about, like, if they can do something like that sort of thriller kind of drama but have it super accurate from a guy who actually lived that life. That's very exciting. People won't watch it if it's super accurate. It, but it's so good. Yeah, but it's boring. This is and this is why movies like Extraction have fireballs everywhere and like shit. <laughs> people don't understand. Like it's not as se it's really not as sexy as most people think. But it is when Thor's doing it. Yeah, but he didn't have his hammer, so it's kind of weak ah, shit. You know what I mean? And no it was hammer. Oh god, it was. Oh, it was Did so he dress bad. goofy too? Yeah, he was wearing like fucking elbow pads from the 1970s. You know, <laughs> Vietnam called and wanted his camo fucking pants back. Elbow pads. Oh yeah, detachable knee and elbow pads. It's like, dude, they've made clothing that have those in bed. Even the Sitka pants yes, have. It's like, come on. Have it. oh. He's supposed to be some high speed operator, and the reality is, like, if you if you sharpen that blade enough, we would go. You go on target, and you don't say a word. There's no noises made. It's 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 so eerily quiet. And it sucks because when we're training, we do force on force drills and you're in there with your buddies doing that shit against you. And all you can hear is like a little scurry. It's worse than when they breach the doors and they like, using like diversionary devices. It's fucking terrible. What's less realistic, that or Steven Seagal lawman? What's less realistic? Yeah. In, uh, between extraction? Between extraction or Steven Seagal lawman? 
Well, I mean, isn't Steven Seagal a lawman in fiction in and of itself? Like, it's a comedy, right? Nope. He actually got a job as a police officer. He was a police officer in Louisiana. and See, he, maybe that even, guy had an Anderson Silva sense of humor, though. He's like, fuck yeah, we'll make you a cop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I think, you know, he's a big movie star, and they Imagine just were happy the to, for him to be around. Well, how about the fact that people get arrested by Steven Seagal? There's a lot of scenes in that movie, that TV show where like, are you Steven Seagal? Like he's get, he's, he's handcuffing these guys. And like, you gay? Are you shitting me? I'm going to say- Holy shit, Steven law, Seagal's yeah. arresting me. I'm going to say Lawman is more made up than Extraction because I think <laughs> they completely manicured the scenarios for Steven because he's probably got the fucking cardio of an ant, right? He's like 6'5", 280. Car- ants probably can go for days. Well, uh, a anywhere. toddler then. Yeah, he's got the build of a toddler. He's just stretched out over 6'5". But, I mean, come on. I would love how he would arrest black people and talk black to them. <laughs> he, would, he would talk like he's from their neighborhood. He would accept up, their cuz? Yeah. Oh, What's up, God. cuz? What's going on, cuz? Like, he would literally take on their 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 vernacular, take on the way their, their accent. And that's where we are as a society? That's what we want to be entertained No, we're with. not there anymore. They, they need to bring it back. They canceled that about 15 years ago. <laughs> Like, well, they chose well, that show canceled. Uh, fuck. Hopefully, the day after it started filming. <laughs> I don't think so. I think, it did a, <laughs> I think it did a few seasons. It did more than one. I don't. I mean, the, he's a reserve sheriff somewhere. Y- yeah, he's a legit reserve. Which sheriff. is insane because then you have HR two eighteen, which allows you to carry a firearm in all fifty states. It trumps the concealed weapons laws. Really? Yeah. All you have to do is be a sheriff. Uh, you have to be active or reserve law enforcement. It was a put into effect, Ooh. I believe, by. Bush after 9-11 in an attempt to allow people in a law enforcement capacity to travel easier with their weapons. Yeah. H.R. 218. Oh, okay. That makes sense. You had uh, Ted Nugent on and he was talking about it. That's how he's able, because California is not easy, Mm -hmm. but if you have a valid law enforcement credential, it can supersede that. Oh, so that's how Ted can travel everywhere with a gun? Yep. Because I believe he specifically said he's a a deputy or a reserve deputy somewhere. Might be a good move if you live in a town where you know the sheriff. Okay, bro. Yeah, but I think there's some liabilities there. And they might actually call you one day. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I would be the absolute worst cop Imagine if ever. you're like, who, who do we have for backup? Well, there's Steven Seagal. <laughs> like, fuck it, we're going in. We only have one person, they have 20. Fuck it, we're going in. <laughs> Which, by the way, is the opening scene of Extraction. No. Thor versus 20 without his hammer, and he still comes out on no. top. Spoiler alert. Oh, don't tell me that. I was going to watch it all night. No. Don't. Is it only one movie or is it a series? I hope it's just a fucking trailer. <laughs> <laughs> I just hope it's the trailer. Isn't it funny how many Hollywood depictions there are that are just so off and just they like they know better. They know how to make something that's just It's because nobody full of shit. wants to see it for real. They'd be like sitting there with their popcorn and their, you know, redneck guzzler of Diet Coke ready to be watch shit blow up and they're like well, how come these guys aren't talking on the radio? What? Ain't nothing blown up yet. Yeah. This movie's eight hours old. I think the best targets that we ever did, there was not a word said. You just knew your job. You did your job. And you didn't have to say anything. You read people's body language. Like, you know people so well that I can tell their silhouette and how they move under night vision goggles from a distance. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's... Yeah. Has anybody ever done an accurate depiction? Like, what's the most accurate depiction? I think you were talking with Trevor about this too. I would say you, you have to combine movies. So you have to have a little bit of the Band of Brothers for the camaraderie, you know, and the, actually the Band of Brothers, both the Pacific and European theater was great. It was awesome. Many aspects correct, many uh, overly dramatized. Block Hawk Down, pretty good when it comes to the the fog of war, the chaos of war, opening scene of Saving Private Ryan. It's fucking unbelievable. Oh, yeah, that's what everybody says. Yeah, that's the one everybody yeah. points to. You know, maybe even a little bit of like way back in the day, some platoon action, just kind of mm. explaining like the lunacy of warfare and even the war fighters, how they're like, what in the fuck are we doing here, man? Uh, I mean, you want to see, you know, I'm sure you've seen it. Have you seen Restrepo? I've only seen part of it. I've not seen the whole thing. That is a documentary that, well, I mean, it's, it's, so it's a document. It was still meant for entertainment, but non fictional. Restrepo will probably knock your socks off. Um, but it's a combination of all those things. No, no one movie nails it. It's not a. It's not a medium that you could unpack a career in two plus hours. It would be impossible. You mm-hmm. need like a Lord of the Rings thing. You need one or two 
Lord of the Rings movies just to explain like the alcohol related incidents and the strippers and the number of divorces. What was that movie that they did with their there was the chick who was calling all the shots and they were uh, the, the, it was the raid on was it Osama bin Laden? Oh, Zero Dark Thirty. Yes. Yeah. Don't, that Zero Dark Thirty. Yeah. yeah. That, that was like taking a shit and then putting it on a TV screen. <laughs> They just, when the girl was like, when they're taking the, the less the direction from that girl, I was like, that, that's not the issue. That would never happen like that. Oh, there's so many things in that movie that would never happen like that. To include the entire fucking movie. <laughs> <laughs> and you can tell it's got greasy Hollywood fingers all over it. Just greasy producer and executive. A fingers. buddy of mine, they flew him out there to be a technical advisor for a little bit, and they had basically already decided what the scenes were going to be before he got there. And he was like, well, where's craft services? I guess I'll go have a burrito. Like, and it's like, <laughs> I, you have a good day to work with these guys. Like you just do whatever the fuck you want to do. Nobody's going to know. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. And, and so I know a bunch of guys who were there that night and, and you, you talk to them. They're like, it was like any other target. They could, it's just, they, it's, it was nothing out of the ordinary. It was like, we planned for it. We executed the plan. Guess what? We crashed a helicopter, but we had planned for that too. So they executed the contingency plan. And went about their day. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I can't imagine how they would get it right unless everyone involved, including the executives, the pe- the people that are gonna make the calls as far as like how much money gets spent or what gets approved, everyone would have to either be a hundred percent on board with what the veterans say or give all those jobs, producer, director, writer, all those jobs be veterans. That would be a terrible movie. We are not qualified for any of those. Roles. You say that, but if everyone's a Jack Carr, right? If there's a Jack Carr director, if there's a Jack Carr screenwriter, they're like everyone of that ilk. But I think what you would find is that everybody has their – if there was 30 people on target, you're actually going to get 30 versions of a story. There are going to be points where guys – who are very experienced, and I, I make the point of saying they're experienced because your recollection of what happens increases as you spend time in that pond. Mm. So guys who are very experienced, they're not getting emotionally attached to anything that's happening or their decision-making or that stuff, and they have the ability to uptake, process, deliver, and remember things that happen. You'll get into debriefs, and you're like, no, that's not what happened. It wasn't that corner. It was a different corner. And so everybody has their own little version of what actually occurred. It would be really difficult to do. Yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah, I mean, Hollywood doesn't get anything right that doesn't have to do with, like, movie making. Like, (laughs) if they do a movie about making movies, they'll probably get it pretty accurate. But every time they do a movie about anything else, whether it's like, did you say that movie Warrior? Callan was in it. Callan actually played me. He actually played what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't know that? <laughs> no. Yeah, it was. I've never heard of this movie. Yeah, it's terrible. But uh, <laughs> it was uh, Nick Nolte's great in it, and Tom Hardy's great in it. But the the movie's so silly because this is what took me out of it. They they fight two nights in a row. They fight and then they, they they fight again the next day. I'm like, do you have any idea what the fuck you would look like if you fought and then tried to fight again? Your whole head would be swollen. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to walk. You ever see those? I would run into those guys in the morning on the way to the airport, and they'd have sunglasses on, and the sunglasses would be sitting a full inch off of their face, swelling because everything is swollen. And so that's so common. You get on a plane with the guys that have fought the night before, and they're just so banged up. The idea of them fighting. That day again is so fucking ridiculous. Why don't they just stay in a hotel room for a few days and chill? Sometimes they do. Some guys, guys, some that's guys the do. move, man. Don't yeah. get on an airplane the next day. It depends on where they live. Maybe they have a family they want to come home to. You know, it's a hard road, man. Being a fighter is a hard road, and it's a short road. And you know, a lot of them are gonna come out of it with some pretty fucking significant brain damage. You know, there's a, a good number of those guys who are going to come out of it, and they're not going to know how to talk right anymore. I mean, I there's there's essence and elements of that in m- my old career as well. Sure, it's uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, it's uh, the last few series of guests I've had on my podcast were uh, very interesting. The guy I just had on was Mike Glover, so he was a SF uh, and. People confuse this term. Like you say special forces, they think that is an over like arching term. It actually means Green Beret. Special operations is the umbrella term. So he was an SF guy and got out and contracted for the agency. Nobody ever really calls it the agency. They just say OGA, other government agencies. 
And we talked for three hours about war and killing people. And, you know, he brought up, we, we went deeper on the topic than I've ever gone before. And the week before that, I had Lieutenant Colonel Grossman on, who wrote the books on combat and on killing. And I have a philosophical disagreement with the points that he makes in his books, largely, at least on specific things. And it's interesting because he was an academic. He was in the military for a career, but never touched combat, which is totally fine. I don't say that pejoratively at all, but he wrote a book and became um, a professor at West Point, teaching uh, largely the psychology of killing and the after effects. And it's crazy because- And never have done ne it? I never. No, he never He never experienced combat. So I, it's, but it's interesting because he gets some of it right. And then some of the things I have a very, very deep ph philosophical disagreement. And it's the same thing with- the movies, right? You yeah. gotta, they get some of it right, and then you're like, for the love of God, why did you just put that in there? Right. But yeah. it was a crazy balance of having those two guests back to back. The conversations were very, very different. I can only imagine. I'm gonna listen. I, I listen to your podcast all the time. I'm really glad you're doing it too, you know, and I'm really glad that this space is opened up for guys like you and guys like Jocko because I think there's, a, there's an opportunity for folks like you to express yourself with no oversight that never existed before where millions of people can listen to it, which is really crazy. I mean, in all of human history, there's never been a time where soldiers can put out a podcast about war, about military, about discipline, and in Chaco's case, about leadership and, you know. And, and, and not getting enough sleep. And, yeah, and, and, <laughs> and wanting to get Alzheimer's and all, all this shit. <laughs> but he is... But this has never been a time like that where you got to hear it from that person without having to go through the fucking zero dark 30 director and producer and all that all the nonsense that's involved in yeah. most almost all other distribution of ideas you, you've got to go through all these people that want to put it on a network or people that want to put it on a station like that is what fucks everything up and what you're able to do now what Jocko's able to do now and you know, and a few other guys out there that are doing it in the same space, you're able to do these podcasts and talk to these people with no one looking over your shoulder, no one telling you, okay, let's stop right here. No one, let's try that again, Andy. I think the way you said it was wrong or there's no, no, no fuckery, yeah. you know, it's, it's amazing. It's, uh, it's been an interesting journey. I think I've been at it now for two, maybe like just over two and a half years. But when you first suggested, I was like, I mean, I'm like, well, I'm like, okay, Joe's like pretty good at podcasting. It might might probably take a little bit of that advice. But I had no idea where I was going to go with it, and I still don't, and it's one of the most favorite things. It's one of the most fun things that I do. Well, you can tell that. That's why it's so good. You can tell you enjoy doing it. I'm fascinated by other people. I don't give a fuck about myself. I think I'm this the highest functioning retard walking on the face <laughs> of the planet. But I sit down with a guy like, you know, like Glover, and... uh I mean, I didn't go through his pipeline and background, or I never worked with the agency the way that he did, or his experiences. And I ended with the conclusion that their community and my community was defined by their similarities, not by their differences. And, you know, he was talking about, it was a crazy story. We were talking about the respect we had for the people that we were fighting. People think that warfare should be framed in terms of hate. I actually think it should be framed in terms of love. And, you know, Mike killed this guy who was a Libyan fighter and kept his watch because he wanted to remember how squared away that dude was and how committed that dude was. He never wanted to forget it. Wow. It was a crazy story. We went, we blasted through like three hours and 20 minutes before I even realized how long it had been. Wow. Yeah, it was a killer podcast. Speaking of which, it's 36. I'm going to get out here. I'm we got to dock the Millennium at. Falcon. Let's dock it. Let's dock <laughs> it because I'm going to get yelled at Sweet. if I don't come home for dinner. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, brother. I appreciate you, man.